Yeah, I just have the same one you did, the Siler Siler Geo Drones. I don't have my name or anything on it. Okay. Do so, but it looks like most of you have. And where it's about 50 50 for those of you who have used Pix4D versus those who have not. Uh, definitely looking like we're erring on the side of uh, little experience. So I'm sure Mark and Travis are eager to hear that and their, their uh, workshop's going to be put to good use today. My name is Nicholas Sanderson. I'll be moderating today's workshop and Travis and Mark will be presenting. Uh, before I introduce Travis and Mark, I will go over a couple of housekeeping things. So this uh, workshop is being recorded and you, if you have any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and Mark and Travis will get to them when they can. Um, unless they want, unless they want you to just come out and ask questions too, that would work just fine. Uh, there's also a closed captioning uh, that has been enabled for this meeting. And if you do not like looking at that closed captioning, you can click on the live transcript CC button at the bottom of your screen, hit the arrow and then click hide subtitle. So it gets rid of the closed captioning. Uh, I know for me, it's kind of distracting. So I've, I've kind of hid that from my screen as well. But other than that, I don't really think I have much more. So I will uh, introduce both of our presenters today. So we have Mark Janesk uh, with Siler. Mark is a senior applications engineer for Siler Design Solutions and has 30 years experience as a civil engineering technician in the infrastructure design and geospatial industry. He has worked for firms in Michigan, Florida, and Illinois in various capacities on infrastructure and survey, product, and survey projects, including transportation, utility, and land development. A native of Flint, Michigan, and a graduate of Michigan Technological University, he now resides in Union, Missouri with his family, and Mark is also an AutoCAD Civil 3D certified professional, an AutoCAD certified instructor, and also FAA Part 107 licensed drone pilot. We also have Travis Lemoyne with us here today, and Travis is the director of Siler Geo Drones and has been with Siler Instruments since, the, since June of 2009. Travis focuses his efforts on high efficiency, high precision data collection by various tools such as UAVs, mobile LIDAR, and GNSS. Travis has been involved in the mapping and survey grade industries as well as optical positioning since 2004 and was the first of our 10 certified, was the first of Siler's 10 certified commercial drone pilots. Prior to his time with Siler, he worked for another hardware software distributor and manufacturer as well as privately consulted in geospatial positioning. Travis received his bachelor's of science from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. So if nobody else has any other questions before we start, I'm going to give the reins to Mark and Travis. Thank you guys for presenting today. And if you have any questions, just let me know. Right up. Thank you. All right. I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and uh, let Travis begin. Well, we'll go ahead and end the polling here. Um, so it looks like... Um, Based upon the poll that was started up, so we we're pretty pretty even mix, a little more on the no end and a little more on the uh, on the yes, so that's good, uh, and a good mixture of experiences on there, so that's that's pretty good. All right, uh, Travis, uh, I'm going to let Travis begin. Travis is going to talk about send some uh, some uh, expansion on sensors, things that get in uh, involved when creating your model. When running through your PIX4D, your, 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 your output data is only as good as the data that you're bringing in. So let's go ahead and I'll stop that share results and uh, close that poll. All right, Travis, I can see your screen. Thanks, Mark. Oh, yeah, there we go. All right. So uh, this is kind of um, uh, maybe adding some more to the conversation this morning. Stuff off my screen there. Um, so we're, we're talking about PIX4D this afternoon. So I think it would probably be a good idea to talk about some of the different sensors and so that that get used on drones and then kind of narrow things down as to what what helps make a better sensor. So um, right here's a list of it's a non-inclusive list of different set different sensors that people are putting on drones. Um, RGB cameras, that's the biggest one. That's where we get a lot of our photogrammetric data from. Um, and uh, we'll talk mostly in detail about that. Some of the others are near infrared cameras or multi-spectral cameras. Um, I guess those two are kind of, of, of similar cloth there. Uh, thermal, uh, zoom cameras, LIDAR and hyperspectral are some of the others. So hopefully my there we go. Okay, so RGB cameras, right? So there's a lot of options. Pretty much any camera can serve as an RGB sensor for, for photogrammetric data collection. 
but a lot are going to be, um, or some are going to do better than others. So the best results are going to come from a couple of different places. So large image sensors, that's that's a big one. So for example, the, the Sony A7R there has a full frame, a 35 millimeter image sensor. It has a lot of right light receptive capabilities. So I'm not talking about the number of megapixels on there. I'm talking about the actual physical piece that uh, that absorbs the light. And, and that technology, it's not just size uh, that's important on that, but also some of the, the newer sensors have a better ability to receive light. So uh, we're seeing smaller sensors now that are outperforming larger ones of the past. Um, so that's continuing to improve as well. So we want more pixels, but not without a larger sensor. So there's some cases uh, uh, where we get, you know, cameras in this, uh, camera companies in this race to put more mega, megapixels out there, but we don't, we don't want to do that uh, without maybe increasing the size of the sensor. Um, fixed lenses for photogrammetry. We like lenses that don't have moving parts inside of them. Uh, sometimes we we accept autofocus, but uh, you know zoom and changing focal lengths are are pretty bad because uh, it's hard for those to stay perfect in flight and and uh, it can really mess with your data. Um, and no autofocus usually that's that like I said that's that's becoming more acceptable now. <clears throat> so image sensors and megapixels both are really important. Uh, but more megapixels means that each pixel represents a smaller space of the image. So if I have a higher mega, megapixel sensor when I'm up at the same altitude with the drone, let's say the same focal length or zoom on the camera, uh, more megapixels means that I'm going to get just higher resolution on the ground. So where you might not be able to see some feature or some little, you know, something on the ground, uh, if you've got more megapixels, you, you should be able to see that, uh, more likely be able to see that. Um, so larger image sensors result in more space, so the physical space on the image sensor to receive light. Uh, it's not as bad of a situation to, to be in a low light, or I'm sorry, a, a, um, a lot of megapixels on a small sensor if it's really bright out. But as the um, as it gets a little bit darker, that that pixels or that that piece on the image sensor that's uh, attached to that pixel is going to start to have more of an issue accurately capturing that. And that's when we can start to see more noise in the data. Uh, when you when that results or when that comes out in your point cloud, you'll see maybe some some things that are off in the, the ortho uh, mosaic, or you may even see a little bit of increased noise in terms of the vertical uh, accuracy on your, your data. So lower pixel density uh, means less noise in the image, deeper colors, faster shutter speeds, so you can fly faster and important poor conditions. So just to kind of represent or talk about the images on the right side here, uh, this is basically the same number of megapixels on increasingly smaller uh, image sensors. And you can see it's just, just representing smaller space for, for each pixel. So to tell you kind of where the industry is at, right? Uh, a few years ago, down here in the bottom right was about the most common size. It was the Phantom 3. And I think when everybody was doing the, the section 333 exemptions before we had part 107 uh, UAS regulations, this was the most commonly uh, requested drone for, for folks to fly with, with the FAA. Uh, then the Phantom 4 Pro came out. Uh, this, we're talking about DJI drones here, which largely kind of hold the market share. Um, now we're talking about a one inch sensor. So things improve substantially. We've got a lot more light uh, receptivity on that, that image sensor. And now things are getting even quite a bit more interesting. So this is the uh, APS-C size. This is the second from the top row. Uh, we're, we've also got a lot more full frame ones. I just got this brand new camera today, actually, that's a 45 megapixel with a, with a, a full 35 millimeter sensor behind it, uh, which is gonna be pretty neat because they're, they're, the cost is coming down on them too. Uh, and then, of course, we're even seeing medium format uh, more uh, in some of the larger uh, drones that are specialized for, for this sort of work. So, see, so talking about lenses, we want fixed immobile lenses and, and uh, autofocus for, okay, um, misspoke a little bit there, but uh, uh, not necessarily, well, we, we want these things, but what I'm going to address here. So, uh, some cameras early on had this power on lens movement. 
So that was an issue because every time you would turn the camera on and off, a little bit of change in the focal length of the camera, maybe even uh, as it's going around turns, there's not a lot of what, what they call geometric stability in the camera. So maybe you go around a turn in a fixed wing and there's some G-forces applied to the lens and it shifts or moves a little bit or gets knocked around by the wind when the drone's flying up there. Um, those can have an impact. Uh, so a lot of uh, multi-rotor drones have gimbals out there, which, which do help reduce that, but generally we've gotten away from power on uh, lenses and drones. So um, see autofocus can sometimes delay the capture of imagery. If you've got that turned on all the time, if there's not a, a good link between the drone, uh, the, what they call the middle point of exposure when that camera actually takes the image, uh, sometimes you can have differences by 5, 10, 15, 20 feet uh, from when the, the, the trigger pulse is sent to when the camera actually takes that image. Um, so autofocus used to be an issue in that. Uh, now we've got that middle point of exposure on a lot of cameras that, that help us uh, mitigate that. Uh, and then different types of lens distortions can create warping of data. Uh, a lot of this, the more modern, modern drone photogrammetry software has gotten really good at, at making uh, great lens and, and camera models. So we, we do have less of an issue with, with that sort of thing. Um, just kind of a sidebar here, a lot of the things that we like for photogrammetric use are the opposite for drones for inspection. So we like zoom lenses. We like a lot of autofocus. Um, you know, wide angle lenses are great to see more at once. And uh, um, so it's a, in a lot of cases, the camera that you want to use for photogrammetric work is not the camera that you want to use for um, uh, inspection work. <clears throat> Uh, another one, and this is this has been more of a, a bigger topic lately, is uh, a, the issue of rolling shutters. So uh, when a camera takes a photo, uh, it digitally reads the sensor. Um, it says, "Wall." It's, it's actually shortly after it's exposed to light, um, or or it could be while it's being exposed to light. So um, let me. Um, talk a little bit about the a global shutter, right? So on a standard digital, digital camera, if you take your, your cell phone and take a photo, uh, what you're going to end up seeing is if you're moving quickly, the first part of the image or as the, the image is read, it's actually going to capture the data at slightly different bit of time. Um, so that's the, the, the issue we have with, with a rolling shutter. So that can cause an issue with photogrammetric use. There are some ways to, to mitigate this though. Um, so first would be to use a global shutter on the camera. So there's either the hardware method or a, a higher end uh, digital, digital uh, capture where it, it reads the entire image sensor at one point in time. Um, so either way to, to, to handle that. And then the, the other way of mitigating this is to use software that uh, treats the image differently where it, it knows that you're moving over time and it, it kind of makes a model based on what, what's going on and, and uh, it figures out what your, your rolling shutter time is and, and corrects it uh, from a software perspective, but it's, it's, that's a less effective way. So the way I like to highlight this is a, the, the uh, fidget spinner. So here's a picture of the fidget spinner. It's not moving in this case and you can see the uh, all sides look equal. So my first one here is a, uh, this is using the a camera in a Galaxy S8 phone, uh, and you can clearly see the rolling shutter here. The, there's different sizes. So I took kind of the long end, and the blue bars are all that same size as the long end. So the, the way it's spinning, uh, I'll, I'll mess this up because of the mirror in, the, in my webcam, but uh, it's spinning and it captures, uh, the, the top is spinning in as it reads. Right, and then towards the bottom, because it's the, moving in the other direction, it looks elongated, so they're not the same. So here's a, a leaf spring shutter. This uh, particular camera is a DJI X7 camera at one one thousandth of a second. It's blurry, and that's just because, uh, you know, it was on a, a bench about, uh, you know, three feet below the camera. Um, but there you can see it's, everything is about, there is the same length. It's all captured at the, the same moment in time. Here's the same, so some cameras do both. This is the same camera. It's at a speed um, that is actually faster than one one thousandth of a second. Uh, so you can see now there's 
there's distortion that I'll kind of flip between the two just to show you what that looks like. And this causes issues in your, your photogrammetric data as you move along. So that's the end of my um, hardware slide deck here. I'll let you switch back, Mark, and go on from there. Very good. Okay. Let me see my, uh, see my screen okay? Yep. All right, good. All right, everybody. So I hope I don't get a coughing fit here. I'm uh, I'm uh, just dry air. It's not covered related, I promise. Um, uh, so what we're going to do is take on from here. So thank you, Travis, for, for going through that. All the all the lens and uh, and data that he was showing for the hardware. Um, you know, if you if you choose the right lenses with the right platform, you, it, it's going to make your quality just that much better when you run the model. Um, as an old saying goes, garbage in, garbage out. So that's that's very important uh, uh, to know. So what I'm going to do here is continue on. Uh, we're going to discuss processing some data in PIX4D, uh, but I'm going to kind of build up to it with some of the things that you need to do uh, to have to prepare for it. So uh, we'll talk about the best collection methods for a good quality model in PIX4D. Uh, the choice of ground control points, because we're going to add uh, and, and solidify our model um, using control points. And, and even if you have a, uh, an RTK-based drone, it's always good to have a few ground control points for nothing more than peace of mind to, uh, to check your data against. Uh, so we'll be talking about different materials, the different types of ground control points available. Um, We'll, uh, we'll talk about you know, other processing software too. You know, there are choices. What I'm gonna show here for PIX4D today uh, is a very similar based uh, uh, process for pretty much any piece of software out there for uh, photo control. I mean, there are uh, even, even ArcGIS Pro will do some kind of uh, ortho mosaic photos from drones uh, if need be. And the, the process is gonna be very similar. Then we're gonna walk through PIX4D. I'll walk you through a project uh, that was collected from uh, from photo to end, um, show you all the products that we're going to create using Pix4D, and we'll uh, we'll talk about bringing that into uh, other software uh, like uh, ArcGIS or Autodesk products, and, and I'm going to show you those two because I have them available. But this is certainly something you could expand upon and bring into uh, you know uh, things like uh, uh, Topodot or, or, or other pieces of software by other companies. Uh, so it's going to be kind of generic on that. And then we'll do a, a question and answer period. Although um, if you do have any kind of questions during the, uh, the session, I'm more than happy to answer them. Um, Nick and Travis kind of keep an eye out for those and, and uh, we, can, we can answer them on the fly if need be. Uh, or you can save them to the end. I'm, I'm not a big stickler on that. Also, we'll be taking a couple breaks during the session too, just to stretch. It's gonna be a lot of information we're gonna show you here. So uh, stay tuned. So with that, uh, I'll Mark, show you a few slides. Yes. We did get a question. So uh, Nick was asking about the, uh, what do we recommend for a shutter speed for the X7 uh, based on the last bit I was saying. So it, it kind of depends. The X7 is kind of a weird camera because of that that uh, rolling um, shutter issue, right? And uh, I'm posting something in the chat. I, I did a blog post on this uh, a while back. And uh, so basically what happens, and this, this can happen in other cameras too, is a lot of them are designed for joint use of, of capturing imagery and video. And so when you go over a shutter speed of one one thousandth of a second, or you go faster than one one thousandth of a second, I should, should be clear about that. It actually goes into the rolling shutter mode. Uh, so there's a couple different things in there. If any of you have the X7 camera, uh, it sh that, that blog post should tell you a little bit more about how to set it particularly in that device. But uh, usually I recommend one one thousandth if you can get away with it. In some darker conditions, you might wanna go down to one eight hundredth of a second. I get kind of nervous at going slower than that just because then you can start to introduce some motion blur. Yep. Or, um, yeah, just generally motion blur. So, all right, I'll let you get back to that, Mark. All right, uh, thanks, Travis. Yeah, I, so I showed, uh, I, I put a picture of the, uh, or, or a link, or, or the, the web page where your link led to, just to show you that when you were talking. Um, yeah, typically, the, the slower your shutter speed, 
um, you know, the, the, the more the blur is going to be introduced, you know, it's, it's got to make up for that light capture uh, one way or the other. Um, that's usually a focal length uh, kind of issue. Okay, uh, so back to this, um, we're going to walk you. So I'm going to talk about and show you some slides. This is not going to be an entire PowerPoint uh, issue. We're going to do actually a demo and walk through data, but I'm going to get some introductory things out of the way. Okay, I love this one. Travis made up this slide and I still love it because of the lawnmower guy. So conventional collection. So how you collect the data is, is, a, is a big factor in the type of data you're going to get out of PIX4D. Um, you're going to want to fly in a back and forth pattern, usually with a nadir uh, style collection where the, the, the camera is pointing straight down in a, uh, almost like mowing the lawn, going back and forth in a linear projection uh, with a uh, setting your overlap. So you're going to talk about forward lap and side lap of your photos. So as the drone's going along, it's tearing, taking a succession of photos. And then the next row over where it's coming back, it's going to calculate that based upon the size of the sensor, the focal length of the camera, the actual view that the lens has, and uh, what your overlap rating is. So most drone software, when you're actually doing the flight uh, 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 preparation in, in the controller, you can set that overlap and side lap value. Um, a higher overlap, this 80 and 80 that you're seeing on the slide here is really good for a very high density, high definition model. Um, there to be high accuracy, uh, but you know, you're know you taking a lot of time. So that's more battery changes. If it's a larger site, depending on your drone, uh, you know, it's a cost balance between the amount of time, the amount of batteries you have to spend out on a site versus the type of accuracy you need. So if you're doing a large, let's say farm field that doesn't have a lot of feature data on it, you may expand that, that overlap side lap out. I probably wouldn't go beyond 70, 70 or 70, 65, uh, 70 overlap side, 65 on the side, unless you have a, a different type of drone. We'll talk about a, a direct geo referencing drone um, has the ability to create a better model on anything less than that. Um, and you're going to require ground control points. So unless you have an RTK drone, um, you're going to probably need a certain percentage of ground control points over a site. So a very large site at a, uh, a higher drone accuracy, you're going to need more ground control for checkpoints as well as uh, doing your ground control. We'll talk about that in there too. And typically, uh, depending on the software, you need to fly a bit outside of your area too. Um, I have uh, one piece of software I use for, for photo processing, Triple Business Center, does a nice job with Phantom 4 RTK data sets, but it trims the data off to that last line, period. There's no option to expand that out. So if I wanted more data beyond that, I would have to add extra lines and extra length to my, uh, my flight lines. Okay. So your flight path design is important for getting a good model. Now, there are, depending on the software you use, I'm just showing one here. Um, depending on the software you use, you're going to have uh, uh, the ability to do this back and forth linear pattern like you see here on the screen or there's also uh, options for doing a crosshatch pattern if you want even extra data. What this does, uh, the difference between the two, the major differences uh, are the way it captures vertical objects. And what I've noticed is um, if you travel a lot in one direction, you're gonna get good facial data on buildings and things like that, but maybe not the sides so well. You're gonna see a lot of blank spots. Uh, some software comes with uh, the ability to add a tilt to your uh, uh, your actual uh, camera gimbal, uh, maybe uh, 60, 70 degrees in a, an oblique type style. Uh, Pix4D can handle that just fine. That oblique data gets recorded to the sensor in, into the photo. So Pix4D understands that it's an oblique photo and that will allow you to capture face of vertical objects. So if that kind of data is important to you, you might consider doing a crisscross pattern and or uh, using that uh, oblique angle or a mix and match between the two. There are a couple uh, in the uh, the new model, new versions of the uh, Pix4D uh, uh, flight software that allows for a nadir style 2D mapping. And then at the end, it will come at the model from four different directions with a 
series of nadir photos to add that vertical data to it. Okay. So we have different types of, uh, of overlaps and ground control needed. Um, this was set up for, uh, for a different type of drone, but uh, this does demonstrate the kind of ground control and kind of pattern that you're gonna need. So for regular aerial triangulation, you're using a something like a, a Phantom 4 Pro, something that does not have a high-end uh, GNSS receiver or the ability to post-process, you're gonna wanna use a very high end lap and side lap. Ground control points are always gonna be necessary and uh, image blocks are always going to be needed. And uh, you, you're going to fly the site in a much tighter pattern, taking a lot longer to fly the sites and uh, to gather that same amount of information. The ground control points are going to be there to be able to tie in the, uh, the model accurately and create a, a, a suitable model for your site. Uh, now we'll add, we're talking about PPK drones or RTK drones. So if you have that option, post-processing, uh, is uh, preferred over RTK because um, you don't need a correction source that could cause an error or a base station out there. Or we'll actually, we'll pull from the base station. We're not going to need that RTK solution. Uh, I've seen instances where it's lost RTK solution and some, some drones just will not capture photos through that session uh, for that length of time. Uh, so we don't need that better real-time to rover. Uh, we're going to get the same results. Uh, we're also increasing our accuracy of the X, Y, and Z of the actual image locations. So PIX4D has a better time and easier time to, to process that accurately with less ground control. We'll still need that overlap, um, but less or no ground control is needed. I always recommend having some ground control, uh, at least two or three points out there. You could use them as, uh, as checkpoints if you're not going to use them at all. Um, some of the models I've run, I've been as close to you know, uh, uh, five hundredths of a foot or a tenth of a foot horizontal and vertical without them, um, just using checkpoints. So um, let me show you that. So you're still gonna have that higher overlap, but we're gonna need fewer ground control points. Now we have a couple drones that we use for photogrammetry. Uh, we have one that uses what's called direct georeferencing. Uh, the, the IMU is a high end, um, uh, inertial measurement unit. Um, it's tied into its own separate GNSS antenna with an offset to the drone antenna. And then the, the, the camera uh, assembly itself and the payload has its own IMU that's tied to its own GNSS uh, point. So between these two, not only is the drone accurate in space, but the actual payload is accurate in space as well. Uh, with that, uh, you need a, a, a much less, maybe 60 or 40, uh, end lap, side lap. You can fly the same site in a fraction of the time it would with a regular drone. Um, and uh, you, you only need one or two ground control points. We also have the ability to fly corridor models with, uh, with either a fixed wing or a, a rotor drone as well. Um, of course, fixed wing drone, that's, a, that's another uh, ball of wax itself. The same rules apply. Uh, you could just use larger areas in, in less amount of time. So your best practice in the field is first your aircraft choice. Um, the the not do it yourself drone is is a good thing. So you know good a good a good professional quality mapping drone. I see a lot of people um, in different various forums that are having trouble creating maps using um, you know Mavic twos and Mavic two pros and and Mavic airs or or something similar to that. That's because of what Travis was talking about earlier. Those sensors and uh, the rolling shutter effect, and, and it's just not a quality mapping drone. So a uh, good quality mapping drone specifically made for that purpose is, is your best choice. The other next choice is sensor, as we talked about, the larger the pixel size, or the larger the sensor, the more light and data it's going to gather in. One of the things to remember about photogrammetry and, and photo uh, processing is it's all dependent on the ambient light. There's no active light source. Um, so we're going to have to uh, uh, fly at a time where the sun's not too harsh, where we don't have too many shadows, uh, but yet it's not overclassed and we don't have a lack of, of high contrast. So without a lot of contrast, there's not a lot for the software to pick out. And the sensor choice is, is a, makes a big difference between a usable data set and a non-usable data set, even for the same site. Uh, your ground control layout and design. Um, I have that twice. I don't know why. And your flight path design we talked about as well. Okay. 
Accuracies of your model are going to depend. And I love that it depends and, and, and it does depend. It depends on all those things I talked about before. So there's several different factors. Each one of them has its own little error plus or minus and they're all cumulative. Um, so if you have really tight ground control, but you fly in a really shady, cloudy day, you know, that's going to throw off the, whereas opposed to if you have a beautiful bright day and bad ground control. So six of one half dozen the other. Um, your, your accuracies are going to vary. Typically, uh, we talk about something called a ground sampling distance. Going back to the layout software, uh, your, your drone flight software, um, something like the, the, the PIX40 or the Phantom 4 RTK controller, as you're flying your, your calculation of your altitude above ground, the size of your sensor, the focal length of the camera, the forward lap and the side lap, you're gonna end up with varying degrees of what's called the ground sampling distance. And what you're shooting for is the lower your ground sampling distance, the more accurate your photo is going to be. When we talk about ground sampling distance. It's, it's basically, it's the, the size of what a pixel on the photo represents. So, you know, a higher accuracy or something that has a larger number of pixels with a, with a very low ground sample distance ratio, you're going to get a very accurate model. Uh, you know, most people tend to want to fly something around the type of uh, one centimeter per ground, you know, percent or per pixel in your GSD. Uh, that same drone, if you fly twice the height, you're going to end up with like a 2.3 centimeter per, per GSD. So your, your horizontal accuracy is going to vary to like one to two times that ground sampling distance in your final model. The vertical is always the hardest component to nail down. It's going to be one to five times that ground sampling distance. So keep that in mind. If you fly a, a site with a one centimeter per pixel, your vertical accuracy is going to be plus or minus one to five centimeters, okay? Uh, just for a ratio, uh, two and a half centimeters is an inch. So uh, one to five, that's plus or minus two inches uh, vertically uh, for a one centimeter GSD. Uh, so keep that in mind when you're flying your site, those are all going to have, uh, now usually we see better than that, but that's kind of like a guaranteed, a hey, one to five is where we're going to be. Uh, pros and cons of photogrammetry versus like, let's say LIDAR data collection. It's got a lower cost, good accuracy, very accurate in colorization. We used to call, uh, call something like LIDAR collection, uh, high accuracy, low density model, whereas photogrammetry is a lower accuracy, but higher density model. You get more density and you're, you're get a better model. Photogrammetry is best used for um, basic uh, ground site, mapping, uh, model creation, mesh model creation, where I would have a harder time creating a mesh model from a LIDAR point cloud because it's less dense. And there's a lot of different other factors involved in that as well. Okay, let's talk about ground control points. So when you're actually flying uh, to process the, the model correctly, we're going to have to introduce ground control into our model. If, if not for a PPK or RTK solution, for a regular solution, we're going to have to tie in our model to ground control. Ground control is any known fixed point on the ground that you shot in via conventional methods or with a GNSS or RTK uh, that has a good X, Y, Z, and that's visible from your photo. Okay, uh, so good, something that high contrast, high reflectivity, long lines, very large and flat. Not good are poor contrast, squares on GCPs, poorly observed, um, something like um, just, you know, played marking paint X. I've seen all sorts of different things. You know, if you could use physical objects, the corners of a, a well-known corners of sidewalks on an intersection, something that's marked that you easily pick that's high contrast that you can see in multiple photos. You're going to want to stay away from ambiguous objects like a flare square the square flat piece of cloth that's kind of wrinkles up with the wind that might move or shift with you know as time goes by okay. uh, some of the materials you can use here some samples of, of good ground control points um, high contrast large enough to see we've got to make sure that point is in there you know you, you can't you can't paint a little six inch x on the ground and expect to see it you know and pick it out of every photo so you're going to want something that's that's there. So we have like a, a, a permanent painted X with the PK in it. Um, 
the 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 permanent or temporary marking tape is always a good choice especially if you're doing like a permanent or semi-permanent if you're flying a site for let's say uh, uh construction progress monitoring you'll want to put something that's permanent or semi-permanent down that marking tape or, or regular paint is good uh we also talk about smart points as as being an option so uh, something that actually the like uh, in this example we have the 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 arrow points that has a uh, built-in GNSS receiver in it. Uh, you just throw them out around your site in random places. You uh, you let them sit there. They're solar powered. They collect uh, satellite data. You set them up before your drone mission, and you keep them out till after your drone mission, and then you upload that data to the cloud where you get a post-process result back. And then you just basically download those points as a, as a coordinate file and can throw in your model for ground control. They're high contrast. That black and white X is perfect. Um, if you don't use a smart, you know, you could set out a couple uh, 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 ceramic tiles in that diamond pattern like that and over a known point that you've shot with a, uh, with a GNSS receiver and get that data as well. So you have all sorts of different options. It just needs to be high contrast and very easy to see. Okay. So now we're going to talk about data processing. There are several different products that do data processing. Obviously, this, this one we're going to talk about PIX4D Mapper. Um, but everything that I'm showing you in this, uh, a lot of it is applicable to other photo softwares. There's Autodesk Recap Photo, uh, Trimble Business Center, uh, there's Drone Deploy. All these uh, kind of work in a very similar fashion. So they're just the final output is varying degrees of better or worse, depending on what you're looking for. Okay, so we're going to walk through a project with PIX4D Mapper at this time. I'm going to close the uh, the PowerPoint. We're just going to dive right in. Hey, Mark. Yes. Real quick. Uh, so Paul Crocker had a question regarding oh. accuracies. He said that's on a hard surface, correct? And uh, I could probably answer that. So, so specifically with PIX4D, they give us some guidelines for absolute accuracy and um, relative accuracy. There are two different terms that, that they do. And they, they say typically uh, relative accuracy. So uh, from you know between points in a nearby area, you can expect an error of one to three times the GSD. Uh, and then when it comes to absolute error, absolute accuracy, it's one to two times GSD horizontally and one to three times GSD vertically. So it's a little bit better. We put that one to five times as kind of a more of a safety catch Safety factor. They, yeah, PIX40 actually, I, I asked them a little bit more about this a while back and they said that that's, that's a two sigma number. So 95% of the point should should conform to that, that spec. Uh, and what was the other? So the question about hard surfaces, I would say probably yes. That's that's probably how they they benchmark that. Um, you know, I, I think maybe the, an, uh, another way of putting that is like, um, you know, perpendicular surfaces or perpendicular things to the drone um, and uh, uh, non-moving. So like vegetation and that sort of stuff is would be would be pretty hard to, I think, conform to that that spec. But um, I I hope that answers what the question you're looking for maybe more information than you wanted to hear but uh and then scott uh galetka said they use different colored bucket lids for control markers I, i've seen that done quite a bit too um company we work with when they go out to do they do a lot of projects nationwide and they'll go buy bucket lids at uh, home depot and, and tape them up and push the nail down and they measure that with their rtk system and and uh mark the middle of them with the, the tape on the bucket lid. so that's a good suggestion sure that's very it. good. Thank, yeah, thanks. I, yeah, that bucket lid is, is, is really good too. And like I said, as long as it's an easily identifiable point with no position, that's that's the most important part that you can you can rely on that to pick uh, in multiple photos. Uh, okay, so we're, we're going to start a project, and I actually have it in various stages for for a time saver to run the whole project would probably crash my computer with this many times because I have all these open. Uh, but we're going to start directly from a new project and uh, we'll go through the various stages. Uh, we're going to be concentrating on PIX4D Mapper in this section, although PIX4D does make a, uh, a variety of different uh, uh, subsets of, of products for various uh, reasons. If you just need ortho, ortho mapping, 
or for uh, for line extraction or for other reasons of um, agricultural that they have a product out there. So we'll talk about PIX4 Mapper in this one. So this is the basic demo page. When you when you start the program, this is the page you're going to be uh, uh, presented with. Um, of course, you can load and download the demo product or the help file, the new project or open existing. Um, and then it lists your most recently open projects uh, as well, news and tips. Um, you're gonna have various uh, interfaces that are gonna change throughout the processing time. So most of these are gonna be grayed out, but most of your tools are gonna be relied upon. Your, your left side here is for uh, your uh, basic user interface for navigating through the different uh, phases of the project. Your top is going to be different toolbars that'll enter commands uh, for either viewing, opening data, uh, uh, and as you'll see, as we run through our model, extra uh, items are going to be introduced at the top. And then your bottom portion at the bottom is going to be for your uh, processing, processing options and your status readouts as, as you're getting messages, they'll be displayed here at the bottom. So we're going to start a new project. And so when you're starting a new project this time, all you basically have to do is click the new project. Uh, you're going to type in a name and, and locate it. So I have a, an area with a bunch of projects here. I'm just going to leave it... Uh, uh, in that same location. So I have a, a folder I'm going to go to. You can permanently select this. So if you have a project folder, you're going to do it again and again. You could just throw them into there if they're on a, on a network drive. I personally do not recommend running this on a network drive just because of the amount of I.O. that's going to be happening, that input output and reading and writing back and forth. You're going to be limited by your bandwidth over uh, the network interface. So my suggestion is have a good sized hard drive. We're gonna talk about computer requirements here in a little bit, um, but have a big enough hard drive where you can run a project locally uh, for the processing end of it. Then once it's done, you can move it wherever you want to, you can save it. Uh, uh, just make sure that you save your photos into the, a similar folder. Uh, one of the things I don't like about Pix4D, but it is happened is that you always have to retain your photos once everything's done. Uh, if you move the photo folder someplace else, the next time you open that project, it's going to ask you to relink that photo set. So we're going to try to find those photos that the model is created from, um, and uh, you, you you better have them someplace or find them. So otherwise, it's going to have an issue opening that model. Okay, um, you could set this project folder in a de default location or whatever. Uh, this is going to be. Uh, I'm just going to name this. I'll call this. Uh, this is a borrow pit. Uh, so I'm going to put this uh, as the live demo, even though we're going to switch, I'm going to skip some of the processing time to, to move ahead in the model. Uh, this can either be a new project or you can merge it from existing products. So this, this what PIX4D allows you, depending on the processing ability of your computer, if you have a very large site, you can run it and break it up into sections. Maybe you have different flights, you flew it in different methods. You can, if you flew it logically and, and, and have enough overlap, you can process each portion of your project as a separate model. And then at the end, you can merge them together and it'll take those data items that were processed in the previous versions and merge them together in a single project. It'll also allows you to add in mixed type of projects. So in this case, we're doing a photogrammetry project for mapping where we did native photography back and forth of the ground. If you did a, 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 another type of flight where you have a, a particular object of interest, a building or something like that, that you flew in like a spiral pattern around there, you would process that using a different mythology in the program. But in the end, you can merge the two together using this project merge from existing projects and bring different types. Heck, you can even... Uh, be on the ground and, and video or, or take photos from the ground of an object and merge that in provided that everything kind of matched together and you have ground control that tied everything together. So that's this merge existing project type. It's a really nice and handy function. Um, I will say this as well. The help button here is probably one of your best friends when you get stuck. Pix4D has one of the best help files of, of most programs I've ever dealt with. It's not super long. Uh, but it's straight to the point. And that's one of the things I love about it. You don't have to go hunting around for a lot of information. They do highlight pretty much everything that uh, you will see in any dialogue box and give a, a, a good enough explanation that you can figure out what's going on uh, by making those changes. 
So we're just going to go ahead and I'll bring it up and I'll show you when we get to a, a, a one or two sections where, um, you know, we're trying to explain something, you know, what does this button do? We'll show you how that help file works. Okay. Well, next, now it's asking me to select my image. So at this stage, I can add imagery. I can add directories. I can add video as well. I guess it can make, I've never tried making a model from video, Travis. I don't know if you have or not. Imagine it takes like stills or it tries to extract stills from the video uh, to, to put those together in a model. Um, I've never used it before, but I know that's either. a thing. I, I would, I would shudder at the kind of accuracy you're going to get out of, <laughs> out of something like that. Uh, knowing most video cameras shoot at a lower resolution than a, in a, not a fixed focus rate. Um, but we're going to add, you can either, either add individuals independently, so I can come down here and find my data files. Um, we're going to talk about elevation data here in a little bit as well. Um, I don't know if I removed that slide. Did I remove that slide from my decks or not? Uh, the, the typical workflow. Uh, let's see. Yes, I did. So let's talk about importing the data. I'm going to go back to the slide briefly. Um, one of the things about importing the data is the thing to watch out for is almost every single drone collects your data in uh, WGS 84 latitude and longitude and uh, in ellipsoid height is going to be the default elevation. Uh, a lot of people, if they run their models without putting ground control in, uh, they'll, they'll bring their model into a, a, uh, uh, their finished point cloud or their finished mesh model into their project they're working on. And, I'm act surprised that it's you know 100 feet below the ground more or less, and that's because the elevation data collected is direct satellite information. So using ground control, you can um, you can modify that and and change that model to the existing ground uh, using the the, the geoid transformation, or you could use like we have an additional piece of software that uh that calls cellular geophoto that goes out to the NGS website and does the calculation, it reads the latitude and longitude from your photos, does the calculation on the NGS website that calculates the actual ground elevation and rewrites that back to the photo. So we can eliminate that. That's good for RTK data. If you're gonna use RTK data without ground control or one or two ground controls, you wanna rely on that more. This is going to be uh, optimum to do. The reason why we'll talk about because PIX4D does not support the North American continental geoid models. Okay, uh, the PIX4D relies on the EGM96. It's a it's a global model. They are a European country. They just have not incorporated that, uh, which is they do on their cloud-based system. Is that right, Travis? Yes, they do on their cloud-based system, but PIX4D Mapper does not incorporate it at this time. I don't know if it's going to be coming in, a, in the future. I'm, I'm probably not. Uh, but uh, we have a tool that will will modify that. Yes, it'll be Pix4D Matic has support for survey accurate geoid models, so um, that does support it. Pix4D Mapper, I don't think ever will support it. It's just different in how they've written the software. So, uh, okay. but this is a this is a good fix for that. So, okay. very good. Uh, okay, so we're gonna we're gonna jump back and forth a couple of slides here. I'm gonna go back to my model. So, like I said, I have several of them open. So you'll see I have two data files here, and and I have the raw photos that are available to me. These came right directly from a drone. Uh, these were all shot with a Pan4 RTK, but uh, this particular set was shot without the RTK. This was regular GPS. So this was this was flown as if it was a drone without RTK or uh, or uh, uh, direct georeference uh, available to it. But the vertical data was, uh, we're, we're going to use that anyway for our initial model run. It should be close enough. One of the things that uh, we're gonna run through and talk about the way we, we map uh, the ground control to the photos. There's a couple different methods and depending on the method you use, if the elevation is too far away from your ground control, it doesn't work very well. So, um, I went through and I ran the geo photo end uh, of that. And so there's this other directory here called uh, NAVD88. And they, we, that basically the software, once it does make that correction, it prefixes the photo with that, uh, that name on there. So I know that these are in there. So I could either choose, you know, multiple photos at the time by, uh, you know, hitting um, uh, 
control A or just shift right click and collect them all or uh, Pix4D does have the ability just to add a directory. So I can just go into that direct data file directory, select it and say choose and it lists all the photos that are in there. So they're all listed. I can run through. At this time, um, I'm going to choose all of them. In the next, I'll go ahead and hit next. I can also remove selected. I can select individual files on here and remove them or clear the entire list and start all over again. Okay. Here I get just a, a little image that says I have enough images selected. We can go ahead and proceed. So next. All right. Hey, Travis, we got another question here if you're available. Uh, what, what are some GPS setups that are good enough to set control in your opinion? Yes. So I, I think probably, uh, any kind of RTK, of course, we're, we're a little bit biased on that. And, uh, we work with the yellow stuff. Um, but really RTK is the important thing. If you don't use that, you'll get, uh, some poor absolute accuracy for sure. And it'll, kind of distort and pull stuff around to make it fit. So, so really the, the yellow uh, or the RTK is what you want. And uh, um, Wisconsin's a great state for that because we have the, the WISCORS correction network and you'll, you'll get good results uh, without having to have both a base station and re, uh, uh, rover unit. So, so RTK. Right. And, and again, that's, that's going to de depend on, on the, 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 the accuracy of the equipment you have, you know, if you have a, a good uh, survey grade uh, um, receiver, an RTK system, then you're going to get better accuracy. I've, I've done has gone so far as have a, uh, uh, a subscription Android phone and Trimble Catalyst with a, uh, with a photo control program on it. As long as you have a precision accuracy subscription to that, I'm still only plus or minus one to three centimeters. Um, if that's good enough for what I need, then uh, it all depends on how accurate you want your model to be. Okay, the next step, once I load my photos in, um, I'm going to get to the actual uh, meat of, of running these, process, uh, these photos. What you're going to see the top panel here is it has read this data from the uh, EXIF data that's on the photo. Um, by default, this particular drone writes in WGS84, global coordinate system WGS84. Uh, all the elevations are going to be in meters, uh, which is typical. And it's what I expect, and and I'm happy to work in those. Um, uh, over time, you you start you stop worrying more about where your ground. What you know, some people are are adamant they want to convert everything to U.S. survey feet right off the bat, and I kind of shy away from that because every time you do that, you introduce an error. Uh, into that translation. Um, in the end, I, I will keep everything in its current coordinate system to the very end. Um, I'll let, and I'll, I'll, when I'm processing, I'll, I'll process to a, a planar projection. Um, but at the get go, I'll, I'll leave as much as I can in the original coordinate system just to reduce error. Um, so uh, it's going to be WGS84. I can edit and change this. If I know this to be a different coordinate system, I can come into the select image coordinate system folder and, and take that out. One thing I have come across is I have come across a one time where it has said, oh, this is WGS84 and put in parentheses, this is based on EGM96. So it's already thought it was corrected. And this was a particular drone software that uses post-processing that writes the software out. And for some reason I had it tagged wrongly as EGM. And so it brought that in. And when I brought it in, uh, it, it, it totally messed up my model and dropped it by a hundred feet when it shouldn't have. So, uh, be aware of what you're reading here. You want this to say pretty much WGS 84. Um, uh, it has the number of images that are geolocated. Again, it has written and read those out. Uh, if I have it in an external file, I can always load that data from a file. If I have a lat one altitude files, some drones, write a separate file out instead of actually writing to the photo. So it has the ability to bring those in as well, depending on the, uh, the, uh, the, the type of, of drone that you're capturing data from. And here's a list of every photo going down. So the image name, uh, we talk, we'll talk a little bit about groups. I'm not gonna go too far into groups. If you have, let's say a mix of sensors, if you have some imagery that is 
uh, uh, additional imagery that was in the folder that maybe used a near infrared or something like that or multispectral and you didn't want them to be part of the model but you wanted to use it for like an ortho mosaic later on you can tag those and give those a new group id so the group id is editable and you could type in a new name here for a secondary group so when you're making your final model you get to choose okay i'm going to make my model or my ortho mosaic out of this group and i might make a second one out of a second group or something like that in the second processing so you can categorize these imagers if you want typically if it was me i'd run them as two separate models and maybe merge them in at the end um, if need be so this group is just a way of organizing it's a it's kind of a fluid thing by default everything gets tagged as group one and you'll see the areas where we can choose group um, later on and it's reading the latitude and longitude, altitude. So everything else is reading directly from the drone. So this this uh, information, the accuracy uh, is the is the written accuracy that the drone calculated based upon its positioning. Uh, uh, it, depending on the model, you may want to change this as well. If you knew, hey, I know that for fact this was RTK imagery, but it wrote the wrong accuracy down, or sometimes you'll run a uh, uh, a, uh, certain drones where you do post-processing in a separate piece of software, the accuracy does not get written to this column. And so what happens is PIX4D chooses a standard, uh, um, geolocation accuracy, and that could be plus or minus five meters and 10 meters or 50 and there's a 50 and 20, I think, uh, or 20 and 50, uh, depending on, on which of these buttons you choose. And you know for a fact that it's post-process and it's accurate. So you can actually change these numbers as well. For horizontal accuracy and post-processing, I would probably drop that down to, you know, maybe one centimeter or maybe one and a half centimeters, whatever your horizontal error is for your horizontal GSD and your vertical accuracy, maybe two to three centimeters on that. That'll help the, the software understand that those photos are more geolocated. It'll it'll rely more on the geolocation of that photo and less on the physical objects is trying to match, you know, colors matched uh, from photo to photo um, is this accuracy. And again, the uh, Omega Phi and Kappa, that's the actual rotational uh, position of the drone and gimbal when it was uh, collected. Uh, so that'll give some information and you'll see that in PIX4D once we bring these in and how the photos are oriented. The last thing we're gonna change here, I'll say next. Oh no, the last, yeah. We'll just go next here. And then the last thing we'll look here is the output coordinate system. This is where I say, hey, I'm going to decide I want to, by default, it's use the same coordinate system as the importation uh, coordinate system of the model. Uh, this is where I can say, okay, I'm going to change it to US feet or feet. And then it's auto detected. This was a this was shot in Nebraska. Uh, so it said, uh, okay, this is in uh, NAT 83 state plane, Nebraska uh in a depreciated one so if i knew it was uh something different i could say no this is a known coordinate system and uh, i could choose the advanced coordinate system and i can choose either from a prj file if i had that or or from a list and this is a standard list of uh projection coordinate systems either north american datum base or 2007 or nsrs 2011 um you know, and I can choose, you know, whichever one. This includes all the county systems. So there's Indiana County, Wisconsin County systems are all down here as well. Um, they, they, they have those in there in the output just fine. That is the horizontal. Um, so I'm just going to leave this back at uh, where I had it uh, in Nebraska. And then for your ground vertical control system, again, if if, if in a pinch, if you're using ground control and you know your, your photos are ellipsoid, you didn't make that, uh, use that uh, geophoto uh, uh, utility, you could use one of the global models here to get it close to your ground control. And then once you're done, we can process it with the ground control. And the ground control is going to have the final say at how the model uh, comes in. So no matter how it runs, even if it's five feet below where your ground control is, when you do add your ground control points in, it will lift up and uh, set the model in uh, at those ground control points. But you have EGM 96, EGM 2008, uh, or GM 84. It defaults to 96. But what if I did use the geophoto? If I did use the geophoto uh, utility, I would go ahead and for, if I'm going to use my advanced 
coordinate options and select a, a plane of projection uh, from a horizontal, and I know that I'm at NAVD 88, I'm gonna choose this geoid height above DRS and set it to zero. So just that default setting. This will use the elevation of the photo itself, okay? When I'm done, I'll go ahead and hit next. It's gonna sit there and take a few minutes. Uh, Travis, a question from Anna or that comment from Anna. Oh, okay. She says, uh, for if you have read it in the past, our group is using Aero Gold GNSS receiver with RTK to set control. Okay, so that was a, uh, an option for setting control. Sure, certainly, that's a, that's a valid, uh, valid option. Uh, okay, so once this is done, we're ready to go. The next thing you're going to get, and we're going to go through all these, uh, these different uh, types of option templates. Uh, so we basically have three types of choices here. We have a standard 3D map. This is what you would typically use for a ground control mapping project. Uh, image acquisition is either from Nader or Oblique Flight. Um, it's going to be based upon a back and forth standard uh, a collection pattern with a side lap overlap. Um, you're going to get a very high quality output, but the processing time is going to be very slow. It's your highest accuracy option you have available to you. The 3D model template is for creating models either from a, a oblique flight around a vertical object or some kind of ground model or something you capture with your cell phone or another professional camera when you're doing 3D model collection. Um, and it's going to be a terrestrial or oblique flight based on, on that. And it's going to also be a high quality, but it, you, you wouldn't run this for a ground map because it uses a different set of algorithms and processes for making that kind of model versus a high accuracy control. There's no ground control or projection data, uh, I don't think for, for any of the terrestrial stuff unless you have that added in. And then there's ag multispectral too, if you have a multispectral camera. Uh, that's going to output different types of reflectance maps based upon your, uh, your sensors you have involved. There's also rapid versions of these same things that will allow you the same type of data, just at a lower quality and faster rate. Um, and then there's some, some advanced models here, depending on the, the type of RGB, ag, ag modified or thermal cameras or near infrared. Uh, mostly if going to get uh, a kind of uh, orthometric mapping out of these or ortho photos. So once you choose your model, we're going to choose our standard 3D maps model, but we're going to modify it and show you the different modifications that are involved in it. Um, I'm not going to start processing now. I'm going to walk through my settings before we start processing, and then I'll just hit finish. And so what it's done now is it taken all my photos in. It's read the EXIF data from the photo. It made that table, it knows where the photos are, and it's laid out the photos on a background map. This is a uh, uh, open street map. Aerial photography is what it's using for the, uh, the map box in the background. Um, so you're gonna get various degrees of accuracy if you zoom in and out. Um, so this is basically the way the flight field is set up. You now notice that these icons here, some of them have come and taken away from, uh, from gray to to uh, bold, so I can actually check them. I can always go back to the home tab here, go to my map view here, and then we'll talk about Ray Cloud Editor here as we as we go on and process it. The icons above here let me get back to my photo properties. I can still add more photos to it, or I can take away photos if I notice I have some photos way out here in Never Never Land. I can identify them um, by picking on them and seeing what the photo is and getting the title on there. And I can say, okay, I'm gonna take these photos on my model. When I come back to this and they'll be removed and it will we'll process that. Um, I could also change and add my ground control. We'll talk about ground control here in a little bit. All right. My background mapping can either just be a, a background street map or the uh, satellite map box, depending on my preference. But it should zoom right into where you're. If you zoom way out, if you see something that's way out here in Never Never Land like this, well, that means you have some kind of pointer photo that got uh, a bad coordinate system and you'll need to, to take that out as well. Uh, but we'll just go ahead and zoom back in here before we start, okay? Any questions on that so far? Okay, uh, it's top of the hour. Let's take a five minute break. When we come back, I'm going to start going through the processing options and we'll, we'll show you the various steps in processing. Um, let's take, uh, it's 2.04 now. 
let's agree uh, meet back here at 10 after two uh, so everybody can grab a cup of coffee or a drink of water or something like that we'll finish out okay all right take five
There we go. I got to unmute myself. I'm going to talk. <laughs> okay, we'll give everybody a couple more seconds to get back here. Um, it is uh, 2.10. Uh, we'll go ahead and continue on. So we've added our photos. Just to recap what's going on. We've added our photos to the PIX4D Mapper project. We've seen that it's associated the, the data that was collected from the aerial vehicle to the photos. We've We've modified the vertical data with a, a separate program to change the, uh, the data to the ground elevation. And we've added them to our project. And we're in the map view right now. We've chosen the basic uh, mapping, 3D mapping uh, uh, template from PIX4D. Now we can modify these changes. Um, okay, Travis. Travis said he'll, he'll be back in a little. Um, so, um, Right here, what you're seeing is you're seeing the map view and at the bottom are your processing options. So as I scroll across the map here, you'll see in the in the lower left corner, lower right corner here, you'll see your coordinate readout. So as I'm moving my my uh, my uh, cursor over the map, you'll get some kind of readout of both in the WGS 84 and my, uh, my projected US survey foot uh, X and Y. Down here at the bottom, we have some processing options available to us. Uh, we also have some output. So if I really want to see what's going on, I can choose not only the processing window, but the log output data. As I'm processing and changing things through, I will get some feedback messaging down here at the bottom. Um, I can change the level of verbosity. Uh, I can get some just extra info. Every time I click a button, it's going to come back, or I can make it and choose the types of warnings and in messages that I want to see right here. It's also going to be able to log the output and save it to a file if I wanted to as well. All right, first thing I'm gonna do is across the top of the three different modes of processing. So there's three different steps it goes through. It does an initial processing where it's building the actual 3D model together, matching photos to photos, matching ground points to ground point, and coming up with your initial control point model is done in the first initial processing. The second step here, Listed number two, number two is going to be actual the densification of our point cloud and the creation of our 3D mesh. If you need a 3D mesh, um, this does a wonderful job at creating a, a mesh of output of your type, typically FBX or, or OBJ. Um, and then finally, the last step is your final ortho mosaic photo, your digital surface model and your digital terrain model, plus any index file if you decide to do that. So there's three steps that can be run. You can run one and two, or one, two, and three, or one only. Um, you know, you have different options available to you. So the check boxes tell you which steps are going to be run. Initially, I only run step number one. So I'm gonna uncheck two and three from here, and I'm only gonna run initial phasing one. So you see the current, this is your progress and status area here. So it's telling me I'm only gonna run the first section here. And then as it's running through, it'll tell me the percentage for each step. So there's eight steps involved with the current step one or, or phase one here. And as it, the current progress is per each phase right here. But before we start, we are going to change some options. So this cogwheel icon in the very lower left, that's where we're gonna open up our processing options. So you have, sections on the left side of the screen, I can change the different three phases of the processing. Um, and then whenever I'm processing and ever I'm teaching, I'm gonna tell people, they're gonna come down here and gonna click this advanced button in the lower left corner. And that's gonna give you extra options for each phase as we run through. Before we begin going through these and talk about image scale and quality and all that, I'm gonna step back to the slide deck here briefly and talk about system requirements, okay? System requirements, uh, PIX4D uh, is a very intensive resource hog. Um, there are certain steps that even on my computer, and I have a very good computer with very high-end stats, and uh, there's a couple phases that I'll run here that'll completely lock my computer up. They'll take 100% of my CPU time, and I'm just, I have to just accept that I can't do anything on a computer at that time. It's good to have a dedicated computer if your budget allows for running this program to allow you to work on other things. And there are other reasons why, and we'll talk about them as I go through this list. The PIX4D system requirements, Windows 10 64-bit, 
you'll want a good quality CPU, quad core, hexa core. I'm using an i9 uh, ninth generation. You want to use at least that uh, ninth generation. There's 10th and 11th generation out. Uh, very high speed uh, CPU with multi-core. Um, you want a GeForce for, I can't say you want, I don't have one, okay? Let's talk about graphics cards here uh, very briefly. Uh, there are two basic kinds of graphic cards available on third party. There is what's called a GTX or gaming card if you're talking NVIDIA, um, or there is what's called a workspace or workstation grade card, uh, which are the, like the Quadro series. My computer, I have a Quadro RTX 4500. Um, it is a very expensive card, but its main purpose is for high-end rendering, okay? Uh, if I do a lot of models and I wanna do a lot of 3D rendering work, things like Autodesk products, I'm an Autodesk uh, uh, certified instructor, so I teach a lot of the Autodesk infrastructure products including 3D rendering, model generation, virtual reality, uh, all sorts of fun stuff like that. It's good to have a high quality workstation graphics card. Pix4D does not worry about that. It doesn't care that you have a high-end uh, virtual you know, uh, rendering card because it won't use it. Pix4D and most point cloud processing software is we're looking for a gaming card like the GTX series from NVIDIA. It's going to hijack or not hijack it's going to utilize the virtual video ram and the gpu for that extra math processing gaming cards are really high end for the math processing they're the type of cards that are used uh, for bitcoin mining and things like that they, they 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 do nothing really well you know better than they process large math sets so if you have a gf geforce or a, or a specify a specific computer specific for PIX40 processing that has a GeForce GTX card, um, then, then that would be what I would recommend. You also want a, a nice solid state hard disk drive. Um, I'm running four terabyte, uh, four single terabyte uh, hard drives, single uh, solid state. Um, it, it, it just helps with that speed. Again, there's gonna be a lot of rewrite information back and forth to the disk. You do not wanna do this over the network uh, connection, like I said. A nice SSD is, is going to be uh, paramount. Um, and again, here, so you have some sizes, small projects, medium projects, large projects, uh, you know, 60 gigabytes, 16 gigabytes. I rarely have run uh, five, you know, most of my models fall in that five to 10 megabyte or gigabyte range uh, for anywhere from 100 to 200 uh, images. Um, I'd say that's pretty fair. Very large projects are going to use a lot of RAM. So you're going to need a lot of hard drive space. Thankfully, the prices come down on terabyte sticks for a, for a laptop or for a for desktop or are very, you know, under $200 for a terabyte. You can get multiple terabyte sticks. I think even actually for $100, uh, Samsung makes some really good ones. But you want one that has a really uh, a high rewrite uh, capability. So I just wanted to go over the system requirements. You, you're going to want a pretty fast computer. Definitely not going to want to use an uh, internal graphics card. Okay. So let's talk about the initial processing. So now we're gonna to go to, uh, do I ever utilize AWS? We'll talk about cloud computing. Uh, good question uh, from Branton. Do I ever use AW, utilize AWS or other cloud computing? I do actually for, uh, for Autodesk products. I haven't, actually I've used it for uh, PIX4D as well. It all depends on, uh, on uh, the, uh, the virtual environment that you have. Um, I'm using Nutanix frames and I could, I could step up a, a larger, uh, uh, virtual machine if I wanted to, to process, I haven't tried anything beyond a 32 gigabytes of Ram one, but the virtual graphics card is going to make the difference again. If they have a, most, most virtual machines do not have a, uh, a, a gaming GPU. It's, it's going to be a, uh, a, a, a workstation GPU if they have it at all, but yes, I have, and it does work just fine. Um, and we're going to actually, I'm going to talk something else too. Uh, once we get done with this, I'm going to talk about uh, Pix4D cloud because their Pix4D does have a cloud uh, based processing too that would save your, your CPU time. Okay, back to here. We're going to talk about the initial processing. So the very first thing I'm going to do is run step one. Um, we're going to talk about ground control a little bit. I'm going to jump back and forth between steps. 
when we talk about assigning ground control, because after we process our model, we're going to go through and we're going to assign our ground control points to our model. But there are two different methods in PIX4D. Both work just fine. They just work in different ways. Uh, once you add your ground control points in, the first one's called the basic editor. The basic editor can be done before you do any processing at all. I could preload all my uh, uh, photos into uh, um, into the pro into the the program, rerun all and, and run all my ground control points. So the the downside is when I load it, and I'll show it to you when I get in there. Um, if you use the basic editor you're going to get a list of every single photo that you have. And you're going to have to go through them one by one to see if that ground controller point appears in that photo and then pick it. Um, the nice part about it is in the list, and you can see a little image of it here. In this list, the top photo is the one that it figures is closest to the ground control point being in the center. So you can start with that top one. But as you go down the list further and further, that ground control point is going to get further and further away from the center and may be visible or not. You know, some 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 photos will appear on the edge, some it'll be off to the side, you won't see it. So by the time you get about 10 to 12 deep, you're going to be starting to skip photos um, that are going to be missing. That other way is called the ray cloud editor. The ray cloud editor relies on hyper accurate uh, positioning of that photo and the ground control point. And the best way to get that is to run the first process. We'll run the initial process one, then we're gonna come back and run the ray cloud editor to add our ground control point. The benefits of running the ray cloud editor for ground control point is that it screens the photos. So you're only gonna see the ones that actually contain the ground control point. The next part is it's semi-automated. Once I pick one or two ground control points in a couple of photos, I can click the button that says automate the remaining ones. And it'll go through the rest of the photos and find that those particular pixel patterns in every other photo. So I can tag like 30 or 40 photos in a matter of, uh, you know, 30 seconds and you let probably less and then move on to the next photo set. So it's very, very easy and very, very fast. Um, Picking ground control points is probably one of the most tedious parts of the process other than just the waiting time. Uh, but again, it requires the initial processing and I'll show you both of them. So that's why I'm opting to run the initial processing first because I want to use the Ray Cloud editor. Uh, going back to the program then. So back in here, uh, I'm going to go to my processing options by choosing my options at the bottom. In my initial processing with the advanced settings done, I'm going to walk through each of these tabs. So the general tab, if, if you do nothing and just run the, the basic and just run through the general tab, you can run a full, a rapid, or a custom uh, image key points. So the first sec is it, it runs through all the photos, it maps them together, and it pulls certain key points. So it's pulling its own kind of ground control points, you know, key features that it can see from photo to photo to photo to photo on a regular basis. And so it, those are called key points. And you could do those either full, rapid, or custom. And there are varying degrees that it does. The custom uh, double image size is going to be very fast, but it's going to be very, um, very loose in what it finds. And you're going to you know, run through and, and, and have to do a lot of correction. Your error is going to be larger. The default is quarter size image. And that's what you're going to see when you run like a full is going to be the original size. For the initial run through, if I'm going to run uh, the ground control with the uh, with the uh, the ray cloud editor. I'll run a rapid one first. Okay. The next option you have on ability here is to generate your ortho mosaic. You get a little preview because you're going to get a report every time you run a stage. You're going to get a little report that's going to pop on the screen, and the ortho mosaic is going to be your first initial quality report. And yeah, it's nice to see and everything, but it's really low res. Uh, you can get an initial view and visual look to say, yeah, my model looks good. Hey, this looks great. Or if it looks all twisted and, 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 and roped around, you know, something's horribly wrong and you can stop the processing and try to correct your issue at that point. But it does add to your processing time. So that's going to be, a, you know, how long do you want to wait in your processing in the initial run, whether you choose that. If I choose rapid, sometimes I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll run the ortho mosaic preview. Um, but once I finish my my uh, GCP in and run it the second time, uh, typically the second time I'll run it, I'll run it full. So I get that full benefit of, of multiple uh, uh, key points. If I look at my advanced tabs also, there's going to be some options here on how it matches the photos. 
uh, by default for this 3D mapping, we're running an aerial grid or corridor, which is, we can absolutely see we're running kind of an aerial grid here. Uh, whereas a 3D modeling uh, type of, of situation, I would choose free flight or terrestrial. So I can override the settings if I want to. I can't guarantee what kind of model you're going to get out. I would stick with the default of that one. The geometrically verified matching is going to check what it uh, captures and, and the key points it makes on the ground to the position, going back to those X, Y, Z, and the by Kappa Omega of the drone and make sure that everything looks good geometrically with the drone. It's not twisted 180 degrees or something weird like that, which I've seen uh, as well on some, on some free flight models. Uh, so that is an option. You can check that on or off. And then the calibration, uh, it's going to automatically target the number of key points. Or if I want to save memory, I can say, okay, let's limit it to an X number of point. Um, I'm not sure the percentage it takes from the automatic right off the top of my head, but it is going to be a larger model of the number of key points, but you're going to get a better model that way. So I typically tend to leave that automatic, but the only ones I really change out of this would be the calibration method. On a large empty field like this, if you have a lot of detail with a lot of, of, of contrasting shapes and colors and things like that, I will typically leave my calibration method standard. But if I have acre upon acre of open green farm field like this, uh, yeah, I'm going to use what's called the alternative method, uh, which is going to rely more on the actual XYZ position of the drone, less on what it finds in the field, although it's still going to match both. It's going to take longer, but you're going to get a, a, a model uh, without running that. Sometimes I've seen where you actually have punched holes in the field. You'll just have empty spots where it just, I can't figure out what the model is, so I'm going to give you nothing. Uh, word of warning, uh, the model you're going to get in the end, because photogrammetry and photo processing does not penetrate foliage, what you're going to get is the top of the ground. Uh, not top of the ground, you're going to get the top of whatever vegetation is out there, okay? If you fly a field like this and, you know, there's corn growing in it and it's already a foot and a half tall, well, guess where your model is going to be? That ground's going to be a foot and a half off the real ground. So things to take into consideration, bare ground is best or, or low grass. You know, if you, if you have really low grass or if you know, you have a no, hey, I know that grass is average an inch and a half high or something on average for, for whatever type of calculations I need it for, take that into consideration. Um, another danger with high vegetation is when the wind blows. Uh, so things like these trees and shrubs or high stack corn fields, if the wind's blowing fairly hard, those corn stalks and stuff are going to wave back and forth in the wind. It's going to be in this position in one photo. It's going to be you know, in another position in the second photo. And PIX4D is going to see those two and say, I don't know which one's which and throw it out. So I've seen on high windy areas in, in farm fields where it just doesn't, or water, rippling water with the wind, waves blowing over. It doesn't like water to begin with, but even if it's muddy, murky water where you get a good contrast, if there's waves blowing on it, it's going to throw that out and you're going to end up with big holes where, where the wind's blowing, where it can't make sense between one photo and the next. So uh, just be aware of that. This alternative calibration will help some with that, but uh, it's not guaranteed uh, depending on what you're, what you're shooting. Uh, you could export these items too. I don't think the exporting does. If you're going to do cal cal uh, <laughs> speak more, camera calibration, uh, you can get these camera files that export out. Um, you can also export undistorted images. One thing to note with certain drones like the Phantom 4 RTK is the camera does give kind of a fisheye lens and especially some of the older uh, cameras that are running uh, uh, GoPros or something like that. One of the, the initial things was that the, the distortion, you get that fisheye look through, through each photo and Pix4D reads that that data is embedded in the model for the camera um, and, and I kind of didn't go over that that's back here in the uh, in the photo so there's the camera model and and all these things on focal length and distortions and lens radius distortion and stuff that all comes from the XF data of the photo as well or you can calibrate that uh, in in here as well um, and, and edit those uh, if you have those calibration numbers. So p 
Geeks Word, he takes that in account and takes that back and you get an actual planimetric photo. And if you want that as an export option in this phase one, you can go ahead and say, oh, and give me those undistorted image and I'll pick an extra file folder and throw all those images in there if you want them. Kind of trims off the edges though. So be aware of that too. You're not gonna get the 100% full photo. Uh, one of the other biggest mistakes I've seen with Pix4D is uh, when capturing the data on the drone, there's an option. I'm going back to the Phantom 4 RTK because it's our most popular model. There's a little button down there on the, on the photo controlling software that says undistorted images. And people will click that and they'll make an undistorted images for their base images. They'll bring it into Pix4D and all of a sudden their model looks like a inverted fishbowl because Pix40 has double corrected what it thought were already fisheye uh, uh, photos. And you'll know immediately that you did that. So you gotta go back and say, okay, these are distorted photos and, and uh, let Pix4D do the undistorted rather than your, your drone flight software. So always, always leave that, uh, that base. So once these are set up in the initial processing, all you're gonna do is click uh, okay. And we're ready to start processing. I'm going to press the start button. I'm going to start it just briefly here because then I'm going to move on because this is going to take a little bit. When you press start, you're immediately going to see the uh, the the circle start running, and you're going to get your status report of what it's doing. So it's now computing its key points. You can visually see in the map that it's going through all the photos and logging and registering them. And once it registers their locations, it's going to start processing to try to match those key points. You're going to get your info. Like I said, we pick all the different levels of detail here. You can get a very, very nice and very, very large file, a log file to go through um, if you want to. So here you can see what it's doing if you're really interested in that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and cancel this section so we can save time and just move on. Yes. It takes a couple seconds for it to stop. If you're in the middle of process two and you hit cancel, get ready to wait for a good 10 to 15 minutes before it finally decides to wind down because all of its processing and time is dedicated to actually making the model more than so than canceling the model. So I'm gonna go ahead and close this model and I have another one open here uh, that has been processed. Uh, this would be number one. So this initial run has been done, I believe. Double check that this has been run. Yep. So once your initial processing has been done, is there any questions on, on that initial processing, the first initial before I had ground control? Okay. Once we've done that initial ground processing, this is going to be the view that you'll see. Uh, this is called the ray cloud view. It's where the majority of the remainder of your time is going to be sent in the software. This is what you're seeing here is you're seeing the 3D view of the position of not only the drone initial, but the drone corrected position uh, based upon its what it's done for the, the ground mapping here. So um, you're kind of seeing the rotation where each photo was taken. And you could change the display on those. So on the left side here, now you have a list of commands, but you have a layer list. So I can turn on and off the cameras if I want to see the key points. So these are the key points it's extracted from the initial model. So just this alone, I can get a good feel of if my model is looking good or if something is horribly wrong with it. Um, you'll see that fish bowling. I've seen them twist away in a helix, all sorts of weird things. Um, so these are the cameras and each of these points, if I select them, these are the control key points, you get what's called rays. Hence, this is the ray cloud editor. So I see the different rays at that little particular position I've used here on the right side it lists every single photo that it can see that particular pixel in and these are what it's using for its matching and control points obviously something that's you know has more definition uh, and you can zoom in and out of these uh different photos independently you can si size and change the size of this you can change the size of the images you can make them bigger and smaller change the overall zoom level you get some basic information of not only that point the name of the pie tie point, but it's also X, Y, Z positioning. And it's, you know, theoretically error uh, in that initial run. Um, so you can see uh, my error is not horrible for that particular drone at, at this time, theoretically, uh, but we're gonna run through and, and, uh, and use the ground control to bring it back into a, a closer match. 
So each of these are the ground controls. Not only that, but I can also choose the photos and, and for each photo that I choose up in the photo editor, I could see the number of control points that were selected from that photo. All right, so here it's showing, this is the particular photo I've chose. I could turn on and off individual photos as well. So you get complete control over how things look. I could even change the color of the displays if I wanted to change certain aspect of the customization of my tools for you know, visual purposes, color blindness or something, I can set these up, okay? Um, these are all my calibrated cameras. If I had any cameras that it could not model, they'd be bright red, uh, they'd be called an uncalibrated camera and I just, they would not be included as part of the solution for the model. So any kind of bad models will get detected and taken out, okay? Uh, I'm gonna turn off the cameras and uh, so you can see uh, the additional details of the photos here. At this time now, one more thing I'm gonna look at is the uh, quality report. So that initial run, once the run's done as well, I'm gonna get a quality report. Uh, so it's just telling you the name of the project, the amount of time it took to run that initial setup was three minutes and 17 seconds on my computer. Uh, some basic summary information about the number of points that it chose, 4,000 key points per image told me that all my images were calibrated. And then here's that preview ortho mosaic and DSM. Uh, again, uh, it's really low resolution. There's not much I can get out of this. It's kind of a preview. It's just you can visually look and inspect and say, yeah, my model looks right. Let's continue on. Um, and I get some basic calibration details, some error ellipses. Uh, my overlap, you want a good overlap. So I have a really good overlap for this model. I can be confident of the area and the imagery that I have here in green, yellow and red would be more dubious, you know, which you, you would pretty much expect for the, the fringes of your, your model to be that way. Um, here you got start getting into some really high end uh, photogrammetric theory stuff that I don't really get into. Um, if you're, I guess if, uh, if, if this interests you, there's some correlation data based upon uh, values, um, your key points table, how many points it could find common in number of images. So um, this is a, actually a good, uh, good visual tool as well. This tells you the darker the lines, the better the correlation between the photos, the lighter gray, the less detail it has. You know, it's, it's pretty confident what you're gonna watch for really light grays or white areas where it has low correlation. So I have more confidence in my model data here than I do out here. But overall, I, I'm pretty confident with my uh, with the number of matches. And it basically tells you the number of matches here based upon the, the gray scale uh, of those. Now I get some geolocation data in here, uh, theoretically error X, Y, and Z. Um, and then some, uh, some variance, some percentiles um uh, media location accuracy sigma location accuracy so if you're looking for those type of rms error you know um uh, of numbers that are they're available in that model and then finally down here you can see my process these are my processing details again i have that quadro card so it didn't use any of it if i looked at, at my gpu for that it was at probably covering at two percent uh, whereas if it was a GTX card, it probably would have taken over 80 to 100% of it and just used that and made it that much faster. Okay. So these were the, uh, this is the initial run as we run through additional, and this is a printable port, a report. It's a PDF. It can be uh, opened up and, and saved. You can save it here to a PDF file if I wanted to for uh, inclusion in a, a project report or uh, put it in my project files at any time. And it's the same report that you get. There you go. So PDF. All right. So once I've done that, now I'm ready to add my ground control points. And I said I ran this model initially so I could add my ground control points using the Ray Cloud editor. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and click the button here for adding my ground control points. Um, by default, it chooses the ground control system based upon my output settings. All right. So um, I can change this if I, if I used a different method for collecting ground control and all my ground control was still in WGS84, fine, I'll go ahead and edit this and say, okay, I, I know my model's in a planar projection, but my ground control's in lat lawn elevation. And so it, it'll go ahead and use those. So I'm gonna import my GCPs. I could type them in one at a time by just saying add point, like a spreadsheet and manually editing these. 
but I happen to have these in a file. So I am going to just browse and they're in XYZ format. Now it has a header on it. So you're gonna see an error. Well, no, I guess it took the error out. So basically I loaded those ground control points in. Here's your point. Here's my type, uh, X, Y, and Z, and then the accuracy uh, based upon, you know, well, normal accuracy, what I expect from my, from my receiver. If I do nothing but hit okay, what's gonna happen is the ground control points are gonna show up in my Ray Cloud editor. And if I go back here to my map view, you can see the ground control points are in my map view as well as these blue plus signs. So that's another good visual representation that yes, the ground control points I brought in were in the right coordinate system. Yes, these are where they're located. You can see I have several throughout my project. Now back here in the Ray Cloud editor, I can kind of see now I use that GeoPhoto app. So my, right, my ground control is actually pretty close to my ground surface. Whereas if this was still ellipsoid elevation, my point cloud is going to be way down here and these ground controls are going to be up in the air. But even if that was the case, once I add the ground control in, it's going to, again, lift the model up to the ground control. The ground control has the final say in the location and the any kind of uh, 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 um, warping and, and, and limits of the model here. So I told you there are two kinds of ways to add ground control to my photos. I'm going to demonstrate with a couple points here, and then we'll move on to the next model. So back here in my ground control manager, uh, there is the basic editor, which I could have run initially. The basic editor is going to open up its own dialog box, which you're going to end up is with ground control one is selected. And so it's ordered these photos. Here's a list of every single photo in my project all the way down from the nearest to this point to the farthest away. And as I run through each photo, you can see it's, it's actually where this little T-bone area is right there. But as I run through, you know, it's going to be here, here. It says, oh, that's all I can't see. It. I know I can't see it, but it's going to offer me that point where I may be able to see it further down, like in this photo. Well, basically, I got to run through each of these photos. I'm going to manually zoom in. There it is. And I'm going to click on that point. Click, click on that. There it is. It's a yellow, yellow. It's I hate this because it's a little yellow dot or a little yellow cross. You can't change that color, can you, Travis? I think it's 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 destined to be yellow there if I zoom out. You can see that yellow cross right there. So that's where I'm choosing that point in this basic editor. And then you can see it's turned green here. Now I'm going to move on to the next point. And I'm going to zoom in and I'm going to choose this point here on the next photo. And I'm going to do this over and over and over again until I have at least, I'd say, minimum of what, four to four to 10 points for, for is what I like to see. I think you need a minimum of four, but the more the merrier, you know, the more accurate you're going to be. But you see this process goes, but I could do this without running the initial processing, but I'm gonna show you an easier way. Uh, let's uh, use what's called the Ray Cloud Editor. So I'm gonna go back to my GCP manager. And this time, instead of basic editor, if you did not run processing number one, this will be grayed out. Now that I've run it, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna run the Ray Cloud Editor and it immediately adds those points to my point list here in my Ray Cloud layer list. So there's my GCP one, two, three, and four. As I walk through each of these down here, I'm gonna change the zoom level, uh, my image size way down. You can see these are all the photos that it knows it can see GCP number two. And I don't have to hunt for them through that 180 something odd list of photos. If I go to GCP one, GCP one only appears because it's on the edge, only appears on a few photos. So this is a lot easier to use. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna increase my image size I'm going to change my zoom level out. And you can see the blue dot here represents where it thinks the point is. I'm going to say, no, it's actually at this point in the image. So I'm going to zoom in here on one photo and I'm going to click this button. And then it puts that red circle or yellow circle with the red, yellow cross in the middle of it. Then I'm going to come down here to photo number two and I'm going to do the same thing. And I usually do this for like two or three photos. By the time I get it in two photos, now I got a green X. The green X now is the computed position it thinks it is in all the rest of the photos. And it's pretty darn close. But the more photos that I click to add that, the, the closer that little X runs into the actual location for all the average throughout the models. Now, once I've added, I'm going to zoom these, I change the image size down a little bit. So I've added this to three photos. 
it's calculated. The blue is where it thinks it was originally. The X is the corrected position. Now, once I've added three photos, I'm gonna press this magic button here that says automatic marking. It's gonna go through the rest of those X number of photos and mark them automatically in all the rest of my photos, just like that. I hit apply and 10 photos have been marked. I'm gonna do that one more. Now 20 has 30 photos in it or point number two. So I'm gonna zoom in on point number one here or photo number one there. You notice I don't have to stray very far. It knows where it is. It's, it's given me all those photos where it's pretty close to the center. Again, three points and then automatic marking. Now there's 30 photos in here that I don't have to manually go through and it's going to go through and calculate that point for the remaining photos. And then I hit apply. And I would go through that for each of these. So each one, you notice there, I'm getting a new line. There's my shift error right there. This was the initial calculated GCP point. This is the photo point that I picked and it's gonna take this green marker and shift it over to the blue marker for all these different GCPs I have in there. And then that's going to increase the accuracy of my, my uh, model and put it at the right elevation. Depending on what I've got. Okay. So I'm gonna skip ahead to the next model where I've done all that. And this is going to be number two with all the GCPs add. Well, maybe I didn't add them to here. Okay, that's fine. I guess I was gonna do it a second time. Let's run the number three then. There we go. So now I had all my photos in there. If I go to my right cloud editor, um, all the GCPs have been calculated out and added in. Um, we've gone through all those photos and, and marked them up. We're now ready to rerun. So at this time, we rerun the initial processing. And typically the only change I make here is to run this to full mode instead of, of a rapid. Again, the quality report at this time, I've already seen it once, unless I want it for an actual physical report because it looks good on the page, I'll typically uncheck this to save time. You're only gonna save like a minute or two on it. So it's really not a big thing. Um, we're gonna get better accuracy and now it's gonna incorporate the GCPs into the model. At this time, I would also pick on that I ever wanted to run step two and step three. So at step two, let's run through these two different uh, steps here. And then uh, I'm not gonna process it because it's really gonna completely crank my computer down and I won't, you won't even hear me talk. So the two is gonna be creating the point cloud and the mesh. So what do I mean by point cloud and mesh? The standard output product for PIX4D is an LAS or LAZ model. In the standard mesh model under point cloud tab, my export is gonna be LAS, LAZ, or I can get a 3D PLY or a XYZ. Uh, typical standard industry is gonna be LAS or LAZ. LAZ is only a zipped LAS file. Um, so it really doesn't matter which one you do. If you wanna save space, you can go to LAZ and uncheck LAS. Uh, either or is valid. However, I'm also going to classify my point clouds. PIX4D is going to attempt to classify the point clouds with ground, high vegetation, buildings, man-made objects, et cetera, in the best way that it can. It's not foolproof by any means. There are better products that do this for you, but for general purpose classification, and there's a, there's a further step down that relies on this, I'm going to go ahead and classify it. This is gonna significantly add time to your model processing, but it's also gonna add some classifications that are not acceptable to an LAZ format. LAZ is an older format, uh, and sometimes LAZ drops those additional non-standard classifications. There's a standard set of classifications. I forget the industry that's that set them up, but like uh, standard, you know, well, zero is undefined, one is default, two is ground, three is low vegetation, four is high vegetation, et cetera. Standard, there's 12 standard classes, and then anything beyond that 12 is, uh, is taken out of consideration in LAZ. So LAS is gonna make uh, a, a better model file for, uh, for me to be uh, more compatible with more tools. I'm also gonna merge tiles into one, uh, typically because it's, I forget the size limit. There's a size limit when it runs through on here. I forget the, the it's like one gigabyte file set. So it's gonna make a series of one gigabyte files. And at the end, it's gonna combine them all into, because LAS files are registered, it's a very simple process. Uh, it re-racks them into one uh, large file. The point cloud densification, this is how, how heavy I want my file. 
by default, it's used to half image size and optimal. This means for every four pixels on my image, it's going to create one point for the densified point cloud. Uh, at a quarter scale, it's for one point for every eight pixels and then one point for every 16 pixels. Or is it 16 and 30? I can't remember. But the, the lower your image size, the less dense your model is going to be. Uh, vice versa, I can go to full size and high. And I think the high density is like triple that. So you're going to get a super dense cloud if you go to highest point density and one image scale. But I can expect this thing to sit and run for about six to eight hours while it's doing that. It's going to take forever. You really are going to be limited by the amount of points that you can use in any particular model. If there's no particular reason you need that high density, I typically leave these at the defaults. Um, I'll show you some products that get created from these point clouds and you can judge whether or not it's, it's worth your time to, to go in there. We talked about the help file here a little bit. I'm just gonna show you the help file on this. If you come down here to these point cloud densification values, it will tell you what each of these buttons means, you know. So a high is uh, four times more process. I thought it was three times, it's four times more processing. Uh, and then the low is going to be one half the amount of processing time. So different point densities versus image scales are going to give you, you have basically all sorts of different combinations of density you can play with. This will go through and tell you the number of points it pulls per each pixel going down the way. All right. So I'm going to choose LAS and then uh, point classified files. 3D textured mesh is going to be a 3D mesh model, typically PLY, FBX, DXF, or OBJ, or 3D PDF. Uh, you can make a 3D PDF of the model if you want to share out to wherever somebody could read it with Adobe. They don't need any special software if you create one, but it does increase the number of, uh, of uh, CPU cycle, the time it's going to take to process. I typically export an FBX file as an Autodesk guy. Autodesk, uh, FBX is an Autodesk format. Um, it's, uh, it's, I can bring it in InfraWorks or, or Revit or 3ds Max very easy if I want to play with that. Uh, that model background I did earlier here of the Siler uh, office in Franklin, Wisconsin, I made it into an FBX and made it into a nice model um, very easily. So it's a 3D mesh. Certain programs will allow you to use meshing. Uh, Revit is one. Again, some of the other programs I made, it kind of makes a nice 3D model. You can solidify it and do a 3D print and all kinds of fun stuff with the mesh model. But if you don't need it for whatever software you're using, things like Trimble Business Center or ArcGIS, uh, or uh, playing AutoCAD has no use for it. Simple 3D has no use for it. So it, I'd be wasting my time making it if I didn't need it. But it's an option there and I'll show you what, what we can make with that. And finally, the advanced, the matching window size. Oh, I had this on my, my head what the matching window size was. Seven by seven pixels. Again, I, I go to that help file. I just saw this and I just, somebody asked me this question the other day. There, so faster processing. Uh, oh, nine by nine use, if you're going to use oblique imagery, it suggests you use a, a nine by nine pixel uh, for better matching. Um, but it's going to take you a lot longer. Back when we created those photos in there, we talked about groups. If I had separate groups here, I could check which ones I wanted to do the point cloud, check which ones I wanted to do the mesh and check which ones I wanted to do the textures. Um, so that's where you would uh, would set, you know, I, I'm going to do group two for texture, group one for the mesh and group uh, one for the point cloud. Finally, in the ortho photography here, the ortho mosaic DSM, I'm going to create a digital surface model. So it's going to take that point cloud. And from that point cloud, it's going to make a DSM, which is a ortho imagery model of the ground based upon grayscales. You've seen these called DEM files or IMG uh, ortho photos. Uh, ArcGIS reads them. Uh, QGIS, I have a couple of examples. I can create contours from them. It's an image-based elevation model. The DSM is the entire surface. Um, it's going to create a geotip out of that DSM. But once I'm done in the additional outputs, using the classified points, it's going to make a secondary model that's only the ground classified points called a raster DTM. So if I wanted that, I would choose this DF. So all the DSM is the surface of the entire model. DTM will be the terrain, the ground only, or its best approximation of the ground only. 
I can also export shapefile PDF or DXF models as well um, in, in various, uh, our contour lines is shapefile PDFs or, or DXFs. Um, personally, again, it's coming from the DTM, depending on how good the model got created with the classification, this could be yes or no. I would typically rely on another piece of software to export you know, my, my contour lines like Civil 3D or uh, GeoPack or anything like that. Uh, finally, the index calculator will create an index map. This is good for like uh, it's a it's a it's a black and white or color photo of the reflectivity of the ground or the the approximated reflectivity of the imagery. Bright white areas versus dark areas, just based upon the color of the of the photos. It, it can't really do much more there unless I had a multispectral camera that would be able to differentiate between different light waves. Uh, so for a black and white photo, I'm just going to basically get a white, black and white approximation of bright areas versus dark areas. It's black and white photos is, is for the most part. But I can also create sub values, shape files and, and polygon shapes of those bright areas. So if I'm doing some kind of lead work or something like that, where I need to, the heat reflectivity or something, I could use this as an approximate tool for helping me, but not, uh, not, not doing that. Finally, resources and notification. It's telling me my RAM and the number of threads. You can see I'm running only 32 gigabytes. Um, I can run a pretty good model with that. Uh, I certainly more would help, but I haven't gone much beyond that. Um, I have 16 cores though, so that helps a lot. <laughs> so definitely. And also it's gonna use my GPO. Again, we talked about the Quadro versus the GTX. It's not gonna do much with my Quadro card, but you can turn that on or off uh, when that's done. If you're using a secondary machine, you can also set up an email uh, settings here to notify you if you, you know, going home and doing it over the weekend, maybe get a, uh, a message that says yes or no. Okay, once I'm done with that, I'm going to start all my processing. Again, I'm going to skip that and move right to the, uh, the, the glamour shot here. Uh, that is number four. So number four, everything has been modeled. I'm going to turn off the cameras and the rays and you can see my ground control points now that green and blue has been shifted together so everything has been modeled uh, once i've run through that secondary step of uh, adding my ground control and rerunning initial processing i'm going to turn on my point cloud densification uh, so it's loading those points into my model at this time so there's my density point cloud, densified point cloud of this site. So you can look in, and right now I'm looking at a view of, uh, of uh, how the points look. I can change the point size down so you can get a better idea of the density of the points I'm getting. Okay, uh, that is pretty much a, a standard uh, density that I'm seeing here. I don't know what the, uh, the distance between those two is. Uh, but this is my point cloud model. So this is an LAS file that's directly built in uh, uh, an exportable. I can just browse this folder. You get a nice little uh, tool up here to browse to your output folders. Each step is put into its own folder. There's the initial, the densification, the DSM ortho. So I'm here at densification point cloud. I'm looking at this LAS file right here. So this is something I could just move, take, and put into any other software I want, Pix4D, Civil 3D, Recap, uh, whatever. Um, but I could do editing in here. So one of the simple things I could do with point clouds in Pix4D is editing. Uh, another thing I, I did when I originally did this was show the point cloud uh, 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 classifications. You can see I got extra layers here for classifications, and I could turn off the ground. Or I can turn off, well, I'm going to turn off my uh, tie points as well. So that's what is classified as ground. And you can see it's left what it thought was high vegetation. And this may be, it's it's all dead, was taken in the fall so uh, uh, or late winter. So uh, it classified this. It's actually just a berm. And, and I would have to edit those points to put them back into the ground class. But you see my, my road is there and I can turn on and off my road. Or I can turn off building, I have no buildings or high vegetation there or human made objects. So it classified some of these, let's say it classified these as human made objects and I wanted those in ground. There is a tool up here for selecting ground points, okay? So I've activated my editing mode and I just draw a, it's kind of sometimes hard to pick. I could draw a quick polyline around those objects 
you gotta be slow with it. And it's highlighted them in red. Once that's done, I can change and say, hey, that's supposed to be ground data, select it and assign it and it's now ground data. And I know it's ground because it's turned it off and I've turned off ground here. If I turn ground back on, you can see, yep, this is now part of ground. There's one of those wet areas in the windy area that I told you that it couldn't figure out what's going on. So it left that blank. I got a couple puddles in here. I was able to do most of this puddle here, but uh, again, I got some, some data that uh, it just couldn't deal with. So and that's kind of expected for, for water data. You're gonna, you're gonna get that. So I could do all sorts of other things here. Uh, I can trim and delete points with that editing tool. So um, I can, again, select an area. If I didn't want, let's say this edge, I can come down here and clean up my edges of my model. Again, pick slowly, slowly. You have to kind of hover over a point before you click. And then right click, and then I can just hit delete on my keyboard. I should have, delete. No, it's not gonna let me delete those. All right, well, there's a way to delete them. I just can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> right on top of my head. There's not a delete key up here, is there? No, no, no. Clip. Oh, no, that's not clipping. I thought I just hit delete them. No. Try to speak up here because I've I've uh, lost my delete key on that. I usually move them into disabled. Do you? Yep. Okay. Just make them go away. And then you can turn off disabled. I guess that's one way of doing it. I like to take them right out of my cloud. And I know I've deleted them in the past or gotten rid of old ones in my past from clipping errors. Um, so that's basic editing in your point cloud. And then once you save this project, uh, it's going to save and write that data to your, to your actual uh, point cloud. And then when you move that uh, LAS file to another piece of software, any changes you've made in here are done. Uh, I also have the ability to uh, add information. So let me turn off my, my editing. Uh, I have the ability to uh, you know, add areas here. I can process an area. Um, I can create line work here. So if I wanted to like create a polyline here along this, I can manually select points along a line. And what it's gonna give me is it's gonna be something that I can export out as a, a shape file. So there's a line here. It shows you the images where that line lies. That line gets added to the right side here and I can export this out as a as a shape file or an AutoCAD DXF or a DGN file or a KML file. There's no automated line extraction tool within Pix4D Mapper like there are in some other tools. Pix4D Survey has that ability to do that. Um, but I have other software that I can do that as well. But it's a simple way to grab simple lines, building outline or something that you want to pick from your model. Uh, as well as surfaces. I can create generic surfaces in Pix4D. And the reason I would want to do that is, uh, let's say this was going to be a stockpile area, okay? I'm going to put a stockpile in this. Oops, let's start that again. Let's say I'm going to do a stockpile in this particular area. I'll make it nice and simple. Okay. I can export this out as a KML or shape file as well. Okay. And it's gathering the shape, uh, the shape of the, uh, the surface based upon the points that are within this polygon. I add a stockpile to here in the next model over. Let's say I refly this again uh, in two weeks after they stockpile the data here. I can go ahead and do a volumetric calculation between the two uh, and I bring those in. I don't have to wait though. There are tools in here for doing volume counts and I got another model I can show you that in. Um, but there is a volume tool here that basically does the same thing. I start a new volume. Um, I, I click for an area where I want my, my area just like I did previously. And then I just run this tool that says compute and it computes a prismoidal difference between, you know, the average elevation of the vertices and what it found in the middle. And there was a little difference. It's not the flattest ground. So it kind of gave me a, a, an initial volume of 123 cubic feet. So it's not a whole lot for that area. It's, it's pretty flat through there. But if I had an actual stockpile of data here, um, you would see it much better. And I can show you that in another, another uh, example here really quickly. But there's some basic tools in here uh, for pulling your point cloud out. I'm going to turn these off and uh, go back to the Ray Cloud Editor and open up the mesh. So I'm going to turn off my point cloud data. And I'm going to turn off all these, these, and these objects. So you can see you can turn on and off different objects very easily on the side. 
And I'm going to come down here and turn on my mesh. So there's my triangulated mesh. So again, the mesh model is just a triangulated model of those points you saw that it's added the ortho mosaic photo on for coloring. So it's an actual 3D mesh model of the site. Uh, there's no points in it. It's not as accurate as the point cloud. It's a, it's a, uh, you can see when we come over here to the trees, it's kind of take just the outside general shape of those trees and made a 3D model mesh out of them. Uh, but something like Pix, uh, 3D uh, S Max, InfraWorks, Revit can use this mesh model in, in varying ways for creating surfaces. Uh, yes, uh, Anna asks, since the program doesn't know how to clarify water surfaces, you could just use them to, yeah, you could put them to, to uh, a disabled group as well. Um, and then make notes that they will like. So this puddle right here, it, it pulled it out in the mesh okay, but you can see what the wave action did. I don't have a very good 3D model in there. So it, it doesn't know what to do with water very well. And that's typical of what I would see for water areas like that. Okay, uh, last couple things I'm gonna show in PIX4D before I move on is uh, actually it's 306. Actually, let me finish these two items. We'll take a quick break. We'll come back to the product data. Uh, Pix4D also includes a fantastic mosaic editor. So my mosaic editor is my 3D orthometric uh, photo, uh, or sorry, 2D, 2D orthometric photo. Um, it processes it in tiles. So you're going to get two outputs when you're, when you're processing here. You're going to get tile data. So for each image, it's going to make a X by X tile, and then you're going to get an overall geotiff. So depending on the software you use, you can load the tiles. If I was using ArcGIS, if I had the ArcGIS online or enterprise server and I wanted to host this tile data uh, up on the site, I would probably load the tiles up to there. Uh, and that way, when you're, when you're choosing areas to download or, or, uh, or, or do any kind of processing data on, you'll only get the individual tiles instead of the, the giant ortho, depending on the area of your site. You know. Uh, for small drone models, maybe it doesn't matter so much, but if you're doing a large city size ortho mosaic um, and you wanna just deal with data that's on a block level or something like that, you don't wanna have to load that giant ortho every single time, you'll want those individual tiles. So this will allow you to do that. So what it's doing now at the bottom, it's loading all those tiles in here in the ortho mosaic editor. So the mosaic editor isn't the final geotiff per se, it's each of those tiles blended together. And I can edit those tiles on a tile by tile basis here, actually an area by basis, change some features, uh, get rid of, uh, replace areas with other photos. You'll see what I mean. There's gonna be a vehicle on the road that I wanna get rid of because I want a cleaner map. I can isolate that vehicle and it'll show me all the different areas that it's collected for that same area shape and I can replace that car with just a blank road photo from another run. So there we go. There's the loaded ortho mosaic. Um, you can see I have a shadow. I should have a shadow of a vehicle. Maybe it didn't do it on this run. And I know I had a car in one of the photos there. Maybe it didn't. Well, that doesn't, doesn't help if I don't have a, a uh, oh, there's, look, there's another control point. That could have been a good photo control point too, but it wasn't used in this model. Oh, there we go. So I got a shadow of a car on the field right here, and I want to clean that up. All right. Pix4D says I can draw an area. So I'm just going to draw a plain rectangle around that. And here you can see the editor. I can choose a different photo to replace this shadow area. So there's the first photo. There's the full car. If I chose number two, it's going to read and put the full car in here, but I want a nice clean area. So I'm going to replace that shadow area with just a clean piece like that. If that's all good, I just say, good, I save it. It's now rewriting that back to the final giant ortho photo and I can clean up my photography very easy that way. So I'm gonna go ahead and um, take a break. Let's take another five minutes here. It's 3.09, we'll be back at 3.15. And when I come back, uh, we'll deal with some of the, uh, the products that come from this software. Um, and then answer any questions you may have. Awesome, Mark, do you mind if I share a PowerPoint for the five minutes? Yeah, go right ahead. <laughs> 
group. Thank you.
All right, I had to go shovel off my uh, my porch real quick. <laughs> okay. All right, everybody see my screen okay? Welcome back. All right, very good. So I'm going to just uh, uh, stop here with PIX40 temporarily. We're going to go through uh, just some of the data products that we just created through this. Uh, that's typical of what gets made. Uh, again, if we look at our, uh, our nice little button here that takes us right to the, the output area, our initial processing is not going to have a lot of data available to us that we can use usable other than uh, the report is available here in PDF that I've created, plus uh, the HTML, the original report is, is in HTML format. So that's where all the pictures and goodies are. So if you wanna pull any of those out for some kind of web experience or something, go right for it. Um, most of your data is gonna be here under two, three, and four. So two is gonna be the densification. Our 3D mesh, I had it available as an FBX file. Plus it created the texture mapping uh, image file. Those typically go together hand in hand. My point cloud was in LAS format. I can use any program that opens up a standard LAS. In this case, I'm gonna use uh, uh, Cloud Compare and Cloud Compare is one of my favorite free pieces of software for viewing LAS. So if you don't have anything or if you have a customer that you're gonna pass data on to, they can quickly download a uh, cloud compare and use that for viewing their ortho, uh, or sorry, viewing the point cloud uh, LAS file very easily. It's pretty straightforward. There are a lot of add-ons and tools. It is open source um, and it is uh, a, a free product. So it's, it's my simple, quick, I gotta open this LAS to look at it type of program. So most things will be able to see that. Um, also available uh, would be my project data, um, which includes, you know, uh, borrow pit complete texture and all that kind of goodies for creating those other sub projects, our products. Uh, next identification is the DSM ortho. So my DSM would be right there. It's a, it's a GeoTIFF file with a world file and a PRJ. So if you're going to drop this into something like ArcGIS, all the data is available to you to to place this correctly into the uh, the model. I don't have ArcMap uh, running here, so I'm gonna use a, a, a different software that runs similar to it to show you that. Uh, and then here, of course, is my Mosaic uh, as well. So I have my DSM and Mosaic and my DTM that was made there. That would be under extras. So my DTM is my finished terrain model that's made from the ground classified points. Okay, uh, finally, I did make an index map as well. So I can look at my index calculator right there. I've loaded my index. This is just a, a, uh, a base reflectivity reflectance map. Um, I chose just the based upon black and white, which uses all the color spectrums instead of the individual colors. This is more meant for something you would use with a multi-spectral camera to get a more realistic view of reflectivity, but it, it does give you an idea of the bright spots versus the dark spots, just based upon the, the average values of what it sees in the photo. So uh, whether it's useful or, or to you or not, uh, you know, you can change to different uh, views of it. There's a black and white version if you wanted to bring that in. Again, it's a, basically it's just an index values of the, the brightest spots on the image versus the darkest spots. Uh, and this is also geo uh, orthometric or, or geospatially correct as well with its own uh, world file and PRJ file. Um, if you want to bring that into something. So I'm going to show you a couple of the products or the what I can use uh, the output of this for. So I'm going to go ahead and minimize that. And uh, like I said, I didn't have ArcMap running, but I do have QGIS. QGIS is one of my favorite little programs for just pulling data in really quick to transform it or, or work with it. So first thing I did is I brought in the complete DSM. This is the digital surface model. Um, it is a tiled view. So as I brought it in, it's, it's made little pyramids of, of the density of it. So you can see my dark areas are the deeper areas, the bright areas. From here, I can extract uh, a hill shade. So I made a hill shade model in QGIS. This is similar things you can do with ArcMap and imagery in there. 
Uh, I made a quick hill shade image of it so you can kind of get a, a, a visual representation of the, the depth of the imagery. And I extracted the contours from it. Uh, as soon as I turn off, oh, my hill shade's blocking it. So there's my contours. I extracted these contours directly out of the uh, DSM from Pix, uh, from the Pix 3D DSM. Um, I brought I brought in the DSM earlier instead of the DTM. If I brought in the DTM, you'd probably see less high points along the ridges here. But for the most part, everything else would be in there. And then you can kind of see one of the downsides of a high density image are the contour lines. The more density you have the more of these little isolated uh, 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 contour lines get created. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Maybe that really exists, but on a typical map, you typically don't, see, you know, most people interpolate. Contours are an interpolated elevation item anyway. Um, I wouldn't rely on them for construction. I'd rather over, over spot elevations. But for, for an accurate model, this model is 100% good to go. I mean, there's my low spot there. There's my actual drainage area right there. I got a culvert entrance that comes in or, or uh, outfall control control structure right there. Uh, so that's basically some model data that I created from the from the DSM. Uh, let's talk about the point cloud itself. From the point cloud itself, I can bring that into various pieces of software. Um, I am showing the Autodesk software. I am not it's because it's what I specialize in and it's what I have available. If I was a microstation guy, I would show you in Geopack or I have TBC, Trimble Business Center. I can do a lot of surface data and, uh, and imagery work in Trimble Business Center, but I'm going to show you what I can do in Civil 3D. So in Civil 3D, um, I also opted to uh, back here in QGIS. You could do this in in uh, ArcMap or whatever, you can right click on this and you can say export and export these features as a shapefile, okay? So the first thing I did in Civil 3D, Civil 3D is uh, also includes Map 3D. Um, so if you have an AutoCAD subscription without Civil 3D, if you have the, uh, the, the tool set, you'll have Map 3D available to you. And Map 3D works similar to the way ArcMap works and the fact that you're you can connect to the data on the outside source. And um, the, the shape file is what I made the connection to that, that I exported from QGIS. And then I brought those contours here into um, to Map 3D. And then I turned on the background Bing imagery um, to bring that in as well. I could very easily have gone ahead and made a connection to the, uh, the ortho imagery. Let's see if I can make a connection to that without crashing because um, they have so many things open. So I'm going to go ahead to that folder. Uh, there's the completes, there's the ortho, mosaic. So I'm going to bring in that, connect. And it doesn't know the coordinate system because it doesn't read PRJs, but I'm going to go ahead and edit that and change it and say this is uh, Nebraska. There it is. Select. I can go in two places. Oh, I should know what edit it. Any E3. There it is. US foot. Select. Okay. Add to map. Oh, yep. There it goes. Locked up. <laughs> it's a very, very big image. Um, one thing you can do, and one, one issue I'm going to talk about with AutoCAD, so there you can see the, uh, the ortho image coming in the background. So I can use that um, as a, uh, put my contours on top of it. I could use Map 3D to, to access this data. I can use Map 3D to access the, uh, the DSM, create my contours in here. So any kind of product that reads GIS or mapping data, um, you can bring in the ortho uh, imagery or any of the uh, the the, uh, the shape file data that gets exported out. One thing uh, Pix4D does not export out is like a standard uh, file or personal geo database. So you're kind of stuck with uh, with some of these other sub products like shape file. You know, everybody says shape file's dead, but it's still the the common DXF of the GIS world. So it's it's going to be in use for quite some time, I think, for exchanging data. Um, 
One thing I have found with Autodesk products and the ortho imagery. Here I brought the ortho. I'm going to turn off my Bing mapping so it's a little bit easier here. One thing I did find with the ortho imagery was it, uh, it works with Map 3D with the data connection with the uh, the FDO feature data connection, but there you can also bring imagery in as a reference file uh, or using um, um, the raster design tools. But what AutoCAD seems to have a problem with are images that have transparency. Okay, so one thing Pix4D does by default is it creates this imagery with transparency. Uh, it will crash AutoCAD for the new, re for some reason, the new versions, it crashes it every time. So I'm going to warn you ahead of time, if you need to bring it in as a reference file and it crashes back here in PIX4D, when you're doing your actual processing options under the DSM ortho, uh, make sure you check the ones that say GeoTIFF without transparency, and then it'll work. What you're going to end up is, is you'll end up with a large rectangular file with black where the uh, transparency was. And if that's the case, once you bring that image into Civil 3D or AutoCAD or any of the Autodesk verticals, you can select it and in the properties when you can apply transparency back to that full black uh, border again. But that is that is something that I found that's, uh, that's been pretty annoying, um, but we found a workaround for it by doing that. Okay, well, the next thing I'm going to show you here uh, to finish this up is a, uh, uh, I did bring the point cloud directly into Civil 3D. Uh, here you can see the Civil 3D point cloud in there. It When you bring uh, any kind of LAS or LAZ data into any Autodesk product, you must run it through Autodesk Recap. Um, if you don't have a subscription to Recap Pro, you can download it for free. It's a, it's also a free product. You'll get 30 days on the pro level. And after 30 days, if you don't enter the right licensing information, it just reverts to the default free version. Not a big deal. It does everything you want. Basically, you start a new model. You pull the data into it. You, it converts it to an RCP or RCS file. And that's a format that Autodesk and Civil 3D can read. Um, so it's it's the same point cloud that you saw in Pix4D and in Cloud Compare. It's just in a different file format. It's it's all intents and purposes. It even retains the uh, point classification um, built into it as well. So once that's done, I could drop it in Civil 3D, and in Civil 3D, I just selected it and said, "Hey, create a Civil 3D surface out of it." So now, if I select this surface. Um, I can uh, look at it. And opt. So there's my same surface in Civil 3D as a Civil 3D model. I can cut cross sections now, run profiles, create alignments, do any kind of surface grading or proposed grading on this surface at any time. Um, and that's directly from PIX4D to Recap to Civil 3D. Um, one more method I have is Autodesk InfraWorks. Um, InfraWorks is another product that allows me to add point cloud data to my model in a 3D graphical environment for use in creating proposed modeling or thematic type maps or, or anything that I can, I can preview in a 3D format. Um, and then once I do that, I can create a surface out of it as well. So I'm going to change to my surface proposal in InfraWorks. I'm going to go ahead and turn off the point cloud data so you can see the model that you created. So not only did it create a surface model out of that point cloud, but it also kind of created a, 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 a quasi ortho photo based upon the color of the points. It's not sharp that you would see. I could, I could overtop this with the ortho photo very easily as well. We can see the contours that got generated from there as well. And then I could turn right around and and export those out as a surface data or land XML or open them directly in uh, Autodesk Civil 3D as well. Uh, so those are some of the civil and the mapping uh, products that come out of PIX4D. Again, uh, any kind of line work in here, you typically can come across any of these items, right click and, and you can export those out. Typically if it's for GIS mapping, it's gonna be shapefile format um, and or KML. Um, so anything that you have that can read and process those KML files uh, um, readily will be able to be used. And that's kind of what I had. I don't, uh, 
Um, I don't know uh, much more that I could show you here. I, I do have one more model I will show you I made, and this comes directly from photogrammetry. It's, it's one of my favorites. Um, see if I can find it here. There it is. Um, it's going to take a couple minutes to open because it's got to open from the cloud. But this is this is what Pix4D can do for you for presentation. All right, this is an InfraWorks model of our Siler Franklin office. Um, I've created it using a variety of sources, including the USGS background info. Um, but right here, as I change to a conceptual view, if I zoom in, there's our office building, and I created that office out of a, a terrain mesh from Pix4D from photogrammetry, All right? And it was, instead of having to try to recreate that from a, uh, and even the, even the back, you could see the, the modeling here, uh, all the ground data here came from that same model. So I kind of used the imagery we got from that model, plus uh, the building that got created uh, as a mesh model from Pix and dropped in here. I just trimmed out the parts that I didn't want and laid it in here. So it's another thing that you can use uh, photogrammetry and Pix4D could process this. I could have changed this and processed this. This came from oblique photography. This is an old model, Travis. This came from an old oblique set that you made for me long, long ago. I see uh, before you, the emerald, before yep. the emerald <laughs> as well. Yeah. <laughs> So this is this is using that alternative method for doing the uh, the, the 3D modeling instead of the uh, the the back and forth, uh, and it makes a pretty nice model out of it with with all that. The oblique imagery gave me all the uh, information for the windows and, and and stuff. It even modeled out the the boxes on the side <laughs> of the building uh, and our and our um, cigarette butt holder. So. There you go, and then the sign on the front. So it's 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 a virtual program uh, you can use for a variety of uh, applications outside of uh, engineering or, or GIS. Okay. Uh, do we have any questions? Nope, I got a chat here. Yeah, we got uh, one question that came in, and uh, has Siler tested drone to map and done any comparison with Pix4D? If yes, are there any takeaways from from that comparison? I could probably answer that. We we do have some customers using drone to map, and it's it's essentially using Pix4D's engine, and yep. a lot of Pix4D's uh, details. There, it handles coordinate systems differently for sure. Yes. Um, it uh, I've yeah I've, I've heard anecdotally different things that it's it's based on different versions of Pix4D's engine, but uh, essentially we see a lot of the same data that comes out of there uh, from there. We it also a, has. Go ahead, Travis. I would say it has some handy um, output to uh, ArcGIS Online as well that standard Pix4D doesn't have. So, yeah. I, I have a customer um, that I've worked with um, in Kansas City um, that uses Drone to Map, and, and we've actually done a comparison side by side between the two. Um, that was that uh, Water One thing there, Travis. Um, and, and, and having played with that output, I could see how it was worked. It was kind of demoed for me. I don't have it. Um, I do have ArcGIS. I just I'm not I'm not showing it in this demonstration, and I've actually run mapping in that. The ArcGIS Pro will do the 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 ortho, but it won't do any kind of surface modeling from it. It'll make a DSM, but you know any kind of point cloud work is not going to be handled there. I, it's comparable, I think. I think the coordinate <laughs> system issue is that everything has to be a, a, an EPSG. <laughs> Uh, compatible coordinate system. And I have to do that with, with Autodesk. Autodesk has some bizarre coordinate systems they make. And if I try to, to set it, then, then if I send it to somebody that's running an Esri product, it doesn't read it quite well. Um, I just did a webinar on using the ArcGIS online imagery in Autodesk products. And, and one of the things that has to be installed is a, is a particular, is the Esri, uh, 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 models um, to run in the background. So everything runs compatibly. That makes sense. Uh, looks like Brenton said that's without LIDAR, the Siler campus model. Yeah, that, that yes. was a photogrammetry from, uh, I think that was a Trimble DX5, right? So that was a, uh, I think it was a 16 megapixel 
APSC. The Sony A7R, I think, is what that one wasn't it, or wasn't? No, that, no, that was, a was a different model. Yep, yep. I don't. We know. have we have a billion drone flights of this site. <laughs> yeah. There's ground control everywhere. That was uh, definitely without lidar. You did do some modeling here with Chevron right there. Obviously, yep. yeah. Trees, cars. Yeah, these these are these are three D model parts based upon. Uh, things I found. So this is not a LIDAR product. It's a model product. I just I just added it in there. My main thing to, to focus on here was the ground was a surface model. And then this was a, uh, a, a an FBX file that was created out of a, a PIX4D initially, and then edited post fact uh, in 3ds Max, just to trim out the stuff I didn't want. That's all. You can see where it kind of almost blends in with the, the actual model sidewalk. So All right. I should add, if, if anybody wants some kind of a sample data set or even a trial license of PICS, you can send me an email. I can put my email address in there too if you want to give it a try on your own and help you kind of work through any issues you've got. There you go. Awesome. If anybody has any close questions, I'll put mine in there just in, just in case. Yeah, thank you, Chaps and Mark, very much for your presentation. I know I definitely picked up on a couple little intricate, just little buttons here and there in Pix4D that I look at all the time, not really knowing exactly what, they, what, what they're for. And uh, so I appreciate that. Every little thing you pick up in one of these workshops is a, is a big deal in your workflows later on. Do we have any other questions for Mark and Travis from the, from the group? Or questions about UAS in general? I know I was a little bit early at the end here. I didn't want to overwhelm you with too much. I could ramble on for another two or three hours of the minutia if you really want, but. <laughs> well, before I, I, well, I, I, say, I say, I have a question. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, have any of you, I guess, had any, I guess, know of a way to take, say, like the 3D meshes and I guess clip them to a specific extent so you're not kind of getting as much overlay if you were to process imagery in different projects? I think, well, in Pix you can, I mean, you can, you can have a specific set. So when you're, if you wanted to mark those out, let's say, uh, let's say there was a specific area here that I wanted to mesh out without using the entire site. If you want to do it in Pix, you can remember, I said you can assign groups. So you can assign some group numbers to those photos, maybe make this area group two, so that when you're actually running your model in the, in the processing options, you can say, okay, group one, two, I want the point cloud, but only two group two, I want the mesh model. And so that would limit the amount of area that you're meshing uh, to play. That's, that's one way you could do it in here um otherwise you're, you're going to use some other type of software um, mesh mixer or something like that you can use that to trim out mesh data post pack or 3ds max you, That's you I would could also you could also define a processing area yeah i think okay. that will uh, apply that to the the mesh as well yeah. I, any reason why it wouldn't i think it does yeah so and if that's I a uh, mesh area like that screen, yeah uh, yeah, let me turn off the is photos, the cameras. There it yeah. is. Yep, there you see. So I line in mesh area, and then yeah, you can. That's it, right? Right where your mouse is, right above there is a processing. Yeah, that's area. the. Yeah. That's the new processing area. So then, if I process it, yes, I'm limited to what's by that area. That's a good point. I never use that, so. Yeah. I usually use the whole thing. I like to. Full blow it. So that's one way you can do it. Um, I, I do want to touch upon one more thing before you leave here, and I, and I pulled up and I wanted to show it. So if you don't have the horsepower to run it, we talked about cloud options. This is a subscription, um, a subscription option from Pix40 called Pix40 Cloud um, that allows you to do all the processing. You upload your photos to the site. Uh, so I did run this same model in Pix40 Cloud. Um, 
you upload your data to the site here and it, uh, it gives you the same, the same kind of, so there's my DSM, there's my ortho mosaic, it'll process it here just like it was on your desktop, but it is a, it is a, uh, limited by the number of photos that you can do. Um, I don't know what the limit is on that, but also total. So you get an X number of photos that you can process for a certain point, and then you got to pay more to, to add to that bank account of photos. So um, there's limitations on that. But you can get a 2D and 3D model. And, and one of the nice things too, is you can set it up. If you have Pix4D, you can set up your model on Pix4D and then load it to the cloud from there. So that's one of the data set options is to open up from Pix4D and do all the processing in the cloud. So that that is a that is an option as well. Looks like another text question too uh, from Kyle. In order to comply with the new FAA broadcasting regulations, where would we get remote ID modules? Would that be through Siler, DJI, or elsewhere? That is a, a a a wild unknown at this point right now. So. Um, we don't know if if the current drones are going to support remote ID. I think that we need to wait for a couple of vendors to to put out some proposals to the FAA uh, to find out what what sort of communication protocols they can use, and then we'll know if drones will be compatible. If you'll need a module, uh, I imagine there's going to be some third party manufacturers of modules once once some uh, protocols get standardized. But unfortunately. Um, I, I don't have an answer to those questions. It's, it'll be wait and see. And I was trying real quick to see if I could find the timeline for that. Um, but I don't see it with a quick Google search. Is it 18 to 36 months after it was uh, published in the register, I believe? That feels right to me, it, yeah. And that, that's when, I can't remember, I can't remember if that's when you're gonna need it or if that's when drone manufacturers are gonna be required to have remote ID as just part of their so I think moving forward, how I read it was that all drone manufacturers are going to have to have remote ID as part of their uh, construction. And the only things that are going to need modules are basically drones that I don't want to say grandfathered in because that's kind of the wrong term, but drones that are kind of that we already kind of have right now, I believe. Yeah, yeah. That and uh, um, yeah, there'll be like a power up self test and all that sort of stuff. It's uh, so it might be kind of weird how if a drone can test a remote ID on a module, there's got to be some sort of communication. Yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff to, to figure out. I'm trying to find the name of this group. There's a guy, Vic Moss, who's who's pretty knowledgeable on this stuff, and he's got a new association he's part of, and they, they put out something pretty good. I'll see if I can find that. Maybe, I, I don't know, Nick, if there's a way to make that available after the fact, uh, a link to that. Uh, blog post he's got about this but yeah, I don't know. I'll look around yeah. well I while I uh, while I still have everybody here I just want to go over a couple more things for the rest of the week uh, hopefully this was a good start to everybody's WLA conference read I believe this year's conference has probably more UAS related material than any conference has had previously we have a you know, a full day workshop essentially at UAS. We have a whole session dedicated to just UAS on Thursday that starts at one o'clock. And then we also have the UAS SIG or special interest group, which has been going on for several years now. And that'll start after those sessions at 4.30. So I encourage everybody in this group to come out to those sessions and hear some good uh, presentations. I know we got Ayers has a couple of presentations on Thursday and then Gene Robinson from Texas. Uh, he's really big in the search and rescue industry. Uh, he has a presentation on Thursday as well. So got some good content still coming out here. And uh, I, uh, like I said, appreciate everybody coming out. Like the bigger platinum sponsors, Ayers, Gray from Datamark, and then as well as Siler, who's a gold sponsor of WLA and this conference. Thank you guys very much for your support. And if anybody has anything else to add before we sign off here, we got a couple more minutes for some questions otherwise. Well, I appreciate everybody uh, spending the time with us today and this afternoon. And thank you, Nick, for putting this all up and, and, and getting us involved and uh, had a good time. Hope everybody learned something. Thanks, guys. There one more comment there from Anna. I don't know if anybody saw that.
show. All right. Awesome. Thanks, everybody. Have a good one. Take care. Take care. Be safe, yep. everyone. Thank you.